Greetings! What is up and a very warm welcome to the channel. The sun is shining and the magpie is casting. Can we you guys? What are we on now? Blur's Day, the 29th of May, with another lockdown midday magpie. Uh, thank you very much for everyone for tuning in, A Game. And uh, is that Dat I see there in chat? Good to see you guys. Um, uh, I see A Game, you just tried to send me a link. Um, just whisper it to me for now. At the moment, the, um, the bots are like, all, all my settings are just like completely restrictive for HTML. Um, posting in chat, so if you just whisper it to me, or you can send it me in Discord as well, actually, that'd be really sweet. Um, yeah, that'd be a really good idea, get some extra emotes on the go. Good day, Emma Duranke, nice to, nice to see you there, thank you very much for showing out today. Um, so, um, sorry for the slightly delayed start, um, basically, uh, I just had a really busy morning, um, I had a couple of things I had to do, and then a couple of things that I had to do that I wasn't expecting to do. Um, but on the cool side, oh, I wish I could move the webcam. We've got the um, Elgato HD 60S video card set up today, and uh, we've got the Nintendo Switch hooked up to it, and I just did a test, and for the first time it all just worked exactly as I was hoping it would, so there is a real prospect now that we can stream console stuff and a couple of other fun things. Basically, it's just a much more versatile streaming solution, because anything that plugs into HDMI, I can run through the HD 60S, so that's really exciting. Not necessarily something we'll do today, although not necessarily something we're not doing today, I'll just have to figure it out. I didn't have time to get the uh, overlay and everything looking good, but uh, we can uh, we can give it a go. Uh, we are rocking a new design. Yeah, Rita Brush um, gave up, developed some really sweet new art for us. So um, if you check out the YouTube, um, youtube.com slash magpie842, you can see the sort of robo magpie banner on full display there. And when the stream's offline and stuff, you can also see it here. Um, <laughs> I've just noticed I'm still wearing this. Okay. <laughs> All right, so full disclosure, my hair is really long at the moment. It's what I like to call my lockdown locks. And um, I don't really have much in the way of hair accessories because I'm a dude, I guess. I'm a guy. I'm a, I'm a, I identify as male. Um, so when lockdown's over or when I next get out of the house, I'm going to buy myself some hairbands or like hair ties or whatever it is. But until then, I just had this stupid thing and it is kind of a hairband. So I've been wearing it to keep my hair out my way in the morning. Like... So apparently it's still on my head. We're just going to roll with it for now. Um, cool. Okay, thanks for the whisper there, A-game. Well, let's do a quick schedule announcement before we jump into the games for today. Boom. St stinger transition. I'm still not over how cool they are. Um, so, yep. Um, this is going to be the schedule for next week. We're going to be doing the Midday Magpie stream on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, so yeah, really looking forward to that. Um, now that we've got the HD 60S set up, we can do some more stuff that should be quite exciting. Also, next week... I think it's next week, right? June the 5th, let me just, or is it June the 7th? Um, is when the Command and Conquer remastered package comes out. So when that comes out, we're gonna be streaming all day. We're just gonna be playing on the ladder. Um, I'll be playing with my friends, or if you guys wanna join in for some 2v2s or whatever, like that's just gonna be madness. Command and Conquer remastered is coming out in a week. So we're gonna stream that next week for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just do some other stuff in the meantime, possibly some uh, Magic the Gathering, which I know I keep sort of, sort of talking about, but not doing because the game's kind of in a terrible place. Um, and, uh, and now I can do Smash Brothers, we can do all kinds of stuff. It's gonna be, hooray, it's gonna be really cool. Basically any game that involves like, hang on, let's bring you back to my face. Any game that involves um, like tactical, strategical, critical thinking, I really like. And some of them are turn-based, some of them are real-time strategy, some of them are first-person shooters, but if there's real-time decisions to be made that are really interesting to watch and perform, then I am interested. So, yeah, um, hopefully next week we can start streaming some stuff now that we've got this set up. Um, hey, Gwadin, nice to see you in chat, friend. Cool, thanks for showing out this morning. Um, great, okay, so I think that's pretty much everything to mention before we get stuck into it. Now, I found us what I think should be a pretty sweet game. First one off the, uh, off the, what, 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 what do you say, out the top of the drawer, out the first one off the playlist this morning. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into what is becoming a nice little midday routine now. Our first game of Company of Heroes 2. There we go. Do you like that sound effects? That was pretty sweet. Um, so, 
spawning in the west here, playing as the American forces, having uh, had some good games, or at least one very good game on the channel recently, it is going to be TR's Fire and Terror. Fire and Terror here going to be repping with the Rifle Company Commander, so these are the abilities, you get the Easy 8s, you get the Rifleman Field Defences, you get the Flamethrowers on your dudes, which is really nice, you get the kind of Stim, which is really nice for your uh, Rifleman, and you get the White Phosphorus Smoke Barrage, so a nice all-rounder package, anytime you get to buff American Infantry, that is going to be a scary commander. Possibly the only omission on this commander for me has got to be the 1919 LMGs, which are not present. Uh, but you do get some other spice, and the Easy 8 is a nice upgrade for the Sherman, to be fair. Spawning in the East, playing as the Overcommand West pieces, it's going to be Korean. And uh, Korean here. Uh, this is definitely a Korean I've cast a few times. This Korean seems to be existing at the top of the ladder. Unfortunately, um, because I'm not very learned in the ways of Korean, I can't read this, uh, and I have no idea who this is. Um, but... Uh, was that the jingle I was working on? No, woo 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 is not the jingle that I was working on. Um, yeah, the jingle, I mean, I am still working on that, but it's just a kind of a matter of as and when I have the time. And with me learning more about uh, Twitch streaming and trying to get this video card set up and learning about video editing and stuff like that, the actual sound production side has gone to the backboard a little bit, but that's fine. We still have everything ready to go. I've got my little MIDI controller and I've got my, uh, well, everything ready to make that jingle just so that's why next week I'm going to be streaming Monday Wednesday and Friday because then on Tuesday and Thursday I'm hoping I'm going to have enough free time to do things like put the jingle together and stuff um, so uh, yeah um, that's her, that's where the jingle's at right now uh, so let's have a look here for Korean we've got overwatch doctrine which I mean I'm still skeptical about chat tell me your thoughts but if, if anyone can sell me on this commander a little bit more then I I'm all ears I want to know why people are taking this commander and to be honest, people have got it on the roster and then not using it in games, which I'm like, eh? So, time will tell on this one. I'm, not, I'm still not sold about Overwatch Doctrine, though. I appreciate that individually, those abilities, those are five useful things. I still just don't think it's as good as the other commanders. I think that there are at least three other OKW commanders that are better. Therefore, I am confused why it's put showing up on players' rosters a bit. Uh, we've got Luftwaffe Ground Forces Doctrine, and we've got the Elite Armored Doctrine, which are both time-proven epic commanders who can do a lot of cool stuff. Faustrum Jaeger are good, and, uh, you know, so is the 221 Command Scout Car, whatever, and the, um, the Storm Tiger. That's also really good. Um, so, uh, let's have a look here. We've got a Kubo Wagon build coming out here for uh, Korean, um, and looks like field control kind of slowly... Just about favoring the American player here. Slight scoreline advantage beginning to open up. Basically the stuff that you would expect to be happening in a game that's about three minutes old between OKW and uh, USF. Uh, so, yeah, so far so standard. Nothing to write home about. And uh, God, I just about managed to get a cup of tea going just before this cast came together. It was a really busy morning. It's going to be piping hot. Mm. Yeah, that's still too hot. Um... <clears throat> Does the early warning uh, offer improved sight range? And if so, is it significant? Um, yeah, so they've changed the way the early warning system thing works. Um, so we're going to have to check on that, basically, because I actually haven't used this commander since they changed it. Um, so we'll wait till he deploys a truck, and then I'll see if it's an upgrade or what's going on with that. It, what it used to do, and I don't know if it still works this way, because I, all I know is it's changed in some way. What it used to do is just dramatically increase the line of sight of your deployed um, tech buildings for OKW, um, which is really good. And it also used to fire a free flare every time any enemy unit touched one of your controlled points on the map, which was very useful. That was really cool. So... Um, if he picks this commander, and if those things start happening, then I'm a little bit more sold on this commander because those were really useful. And specifically for me, because I enjoy playing with tank hunter units, having a Jagd Panzer with extended line of sight from all your buildings and early warning flares from the points, nice. Like, that is, there's some synergy there. It's really nice. I'm not saying it's like overwhelmingly powerful, but it's good to have in the same way that it's good to have spotting scopes on your Stug or whatever. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yesterday someone said that Jaeger Lights beat UKF Basic Infantry, and that's why put it, people put it in their roster. Yeah, I imagine Jaeger Lights probably do beat UKF Basic Infantry until the UKF get five-man squad upgrades and Bren guns, and then I don't believe uh, then I don't believe it. Um, so, I mean, we'll see. Well, I, I remain to be convinced on that. Looks like we've got Lieutenant Tech here coming out from the American player, so that's going to be the direction here for Fire and Terror, and that is still the tech that we are most used to seeing, but it's nice. I think the American tech tree is a little bit more alive than I was giving it credit for. We do see Captain in a lot of games, it's just it often comes down after Lieutenant, and that's fine. That actually is 
it's a nice dynamic. I'm glad the American tech tree just feels completely viable and everything. Um, I think un unupgraded Jaeger lights, like unupgraded Jaeger lights, will beat Tommies um, until the Tommies have five man and or Bren guns, I believe. But yeah, I think unupgraded um, Jaeger lights will. That's uh, that's my impression. So uh, anyway, we've got a nice, uh, nice concave of uh, OKW rifles here blazing away, and that is actually going to be enough to swing this battle here. So removing some American value from the front line, it's going to be nice. The Kuba wagon just gets taken out here. Uh, that was uh, the 50 cal, I believe, shredding that one up as they are wont to do. So yep, going for a nice early machine gun here as the American player. Look how big that is. An MH MH2B was it called? The 50 cal? Yeah, the M M2HB. That is huge. Like. Imagine having to carry that around for your job, to run around with that all day. Jesus. Not to mention, how much does the ammo weigh? Like, a 50 caliber round per bullet must be weighing... I don't know. That's hard to guess, actually. It's got to weigh, like, 20 grams. No, more. I don't know. That's really difficult to get. Yeah, because it's made of lead. It's got to be way more than 20 grams, hasn't it? Um... Uh, <laughs> Datton. Absolutely, buddy. We can check out the bulletins for you. Um... So it looks like the American player is rolling with all rifleman uh, DPS increases. Oh, and the veterancy uh, speed increase, which, to be honest, I really like that one for um, for USF because sometimes you see American squads, and it's rare, but it does happen, you see American riflemen not be able to break the engine on a tank that would have been game-changing because they just didn't quite have vet one, and that's really that's really nice and also i mean your core infantry you always want them to be vetting up quicker than your opponents and every edge that you can get in that regard is valid so yeah the uh, rifleman gaining veterancy 10 percent faster one i like the others are just dps increases for korean it looks like we've got the med kits uh, cost less one that we often see used we've got the panzer fours five percent increased armor that's cool so decently increased chances of bouncing anti-tank gun rounds and uh, and, and help, helping to swing tank battles and we've got kuba wagons gain oh this is a favorite of mine yeah Time was, I used to run with a lot of Kubelwagen strats. Um, yeah, Kubelwagen are already very nimble, uh, so when you add faster acceleration and increased movement speed, it can sometimes pull them out of the fire a little bit faster, take a few fewer hits, perhaps save their lives in a pinch, you know, make them quicker to repair, get around the map faster, just do, do Kubelwagen stuff slightly more efficient. The numbers are slim, but you actually get that increased acceleration, so they do feel slightly more sprightly to micro, and that's really nice. Captain Tech here, coming out for the American player. No way! Emma Duranke. Your father was a paratrooper. Wow. In World War II. Amazing. Um, and Dan, I did read that movement speed bulletins. Get them past breakpoints. Huh, interesting. Okay, not in World War II, alright. I mean, it's no less valid, it's just, that's that's still really cool. Um, okay, so um, yeah, we've got STGs popping up on these Volks Grenadiers now. Uh, Korean has had uh, decent munitions income, connecting that munitions point in the north, and sometimes... Actually, did he connect the one in the south? Actually, I'm not sure if he did. Um, <clears throat> pretty sure he didn't, actually. Flamethrowers coming up on these rear ash is just such a nice piece of spice to add to the USF roster. I really like it. Turning your rear ash from sort of like basically combat ineffectual squads into like pioneer slash engineer with flamethrower equivalents is so nice when you're already working with powerful American infantry and officers. Um, turning these units into like pressure, uh, flamethrower pressure squads is like really nice. So this is, it's, it's, this is part of the reason I really like the rifle company. And this way you put the veterancy onto the rear ash, which I believe still buffs their repair speed. Oh, no, it's okay. Three stars is when they get the repair time increase, uh, like the repair speed increase. Okay. Um, but still, it gets them towards that a little bit faster. I mean, a lot faster. So that's that's pretty nice to have. Looks like a uh, MG34 has been added into the roster here for Korean, and that is starting to curtail the effectiveness of this American infantry. If we crack the tack, we can see mm, it is the Axis player who is slightly the underdog. Uh, Going to be bleeding out. At, at the moment, it's a double cap, so they don't actually control South VP. Some Volks Grenadiers moving in to take care of that just now. Uh, and the American player, just with just slightly more field control, pretty much as we're used to seeing. But there is a lot of pressure coming in. Fire and Terror is pushing the center of this line pretty hard. And the Axis squads are having to fall back and reinforce. So I 
wonder if the American player can perhaps break through in the next minute or two. If we can get the 50 cal up into this building, perhaps that would be a good start towards that. Major tech is already out. Christ, this feels fast. That feels really fast. This is like 10 minute major tech after he's completed the tech tree. Like, wow. That seems pretty out there, to be honest. Uh, okay, fantastic stuff. Um, I guess the fuel income has been decent. Why is that major so fast? Uh, I feel like I've missed something. Anyway, Panzer II is going to be the tech here. Uh, the, sorry, the choice here. So it's going to be mechanized, uh, mechanized HQ for the OKW player. And this Panzer II is going to have to be the rock in the river here to try and hold back the tide. American units are pushing hard. Raketenwerfer has be is being shoved back. That is a... Uh, a sort of prophylactic, a preventative uh, Raketenwerfer, but there is actually no real target out on the map for that unit just now. Uh, the uh, MG-34 is getting flamed, but a flank of Volks here is going to break all of the American advance. The rear ash had to give way. This is too many STGs, and the damage from the Panzer II. And it looks like we've got a bit of a Blitzkrieg moment here, as the Panzer II is overrunning through the countryside. Korean taking ground so fast. American units just being forced back because of loss of lack of support. Now, uh, the Zook is up on the left tenant so that is one unit there we go that is one way of getting some damage onto this panzer II. but yeah the pressure is really on now the 50 cal gets set up in a really nice position but look at the focus fire so good from korea and he knows that exactly the 50 cal is the most important thing that needs to be picked down here and he's putting tons of damage on it gonna get the squad wipe now he can continue fighting here getting the mg34 set up on the doorstep of the american base controlling the cutoff Wow, this is a brutal assault. Korean putting on such a showcase of early game OKW pressure here. Just getting a bit of momentum and then snowballing with some smart decision making. Now the Panzer II is forced away uh, because there's an M1AT gun lurking back here for the American player. And uh, with the Panzer II gone, that is a lot of momentum. American forces attempting to reman the 50 cal, but they will get, get slaughtered. STGs at this range prov providing just so much damage. Here comes the white phosphorus barrage though. So that should force the German uh, forces to have to scatter here. And, but look at that actually, he actually mitigates the damage so well. Korean might actually be able to maintain the contain because he's got two squads of Volks and the um, MG34 still in position. Mr. Wipe in the middle of the screen. Don't worry, bro. It's, I'm such a good caster. We're all about missing wipes in the middle of the screen. What 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 unit did I miss getting wipes? Just just for my information. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So okay, that that was just a beautiful move there for uh, for Korean. Let, let's crack the tech. We can see making a lot of ground up on the map as well, and still cutting off so much resources. This game has had quite the swing here. Oh, it was the Zook officer. Oh yeah, yeah, it was the lieutenant. Okay, thanks very much, chat. This is why, this is why casting on Twitch and having chat to help me out live is great. Just more pairs of eyes. There's so much going on in RTS games. Um, so I really appreciate your help. Thanks, guys. Yep. So yeah, the lieutenant does get gunned down in there as well as losing the uh, the 50 cal squad twice. Um, and this 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 MG34 is still here. There's no mortar for the American player. Um, I'm gonna get rid of that. <laughs> There's no mortar here for the American player. So. Um, so this contain is really good. Now the Axis player can use these buildings. Volks Grenadiers in good cover. Now this is a lot of Americans. The Panzer II is almost fully repaired. Oh, he's going to flank with the Panzer II. Look at that Panzer II looking for a sweet angle to come in. The rear ash are going to spot that, but... Uh, okay, a lot of Vol the Volks Grenadiers are just getting kind of taxed down. If the MG34 can, t can transition into this building, is that a good idea? That seems like it... Oh no, because the flamethrower is already here, so that can't be done. And yeah, finally, Fire and Terror is going to be able to take control of the cutoff and, and resume their position out on the map. But that was a really lovely phase of domination there for Korean, doing a lot of damage to the American army and also to the resource income of the American forces. That's so nice. Uh, the Axis MG getting the kill apparently on that on that lieutenant. Okay. Um, I don't know actually what happened to the Zook. I'm not sure that it dropped. Uh, I don't think you can shoot and destroy weapons that are on the floor. Only um, only like weapon squad weapons, if that makes sense. Uh, so I can't see the Zook here. It's possible it got picked up by some rear ash. I uh, don't see it there either, actually. Is it on the captain? Yeah, so the Zoot got picked up on the captain. There it is. Um, all right, so it uh, looks like Schwerpanzer HQ will be coming down here momentarily. Oh, it's going to be a Puma. Cool. 
Okay. All right. Well, the Puma makes a lot of sense. Um, Korean has to know that they're up against the Rifle Commander. Uh, and... Oh, did Axis donate the MG34? Oh, nasty. Oh, well, it looks like we're going to have a hardware exchange. Um... <laughs> so, yeah, the American force is going to... We're having a little hardware exchange here. Going to... Equal opportunities going to enable the Germans to learn how to use this... Come on, we need to grab the MG... The, M, the, M, the 50 cal. Surely we want the 50 cal. Puma got cancelled. Okay, so it did. Um, interesting. I think I quite liked the Puma, if I'm honest. The ability to have... Uh, the wind-up toy build on the go. Gets the 50 cal, gonna set that one up immediately. Now it's 50 cal versus MG34, but not in the hands of the uh, users that you'd expect. And um, yeah, this 50 cal gets set up in a lovely position, just doing a stack of damage off the bat. Has to think about falling back soon though. This is way too many Americans on the dance floor. He has to think about falling back the 50 cal if he wants to pull that hardware out of there. And you have to think he probably does. That fallback is quite late. The received accuracy on weapons teams is nasty, but okay. A very well-timed fallback there by Korean. I was worried, but apparently I need not be. That 50 cal gets out safely. I just, you know how it is with weapon teams. Like, you'll hit fallback, and then they're taking so much fire that the guy who's packing up the weapon just keeps getting picked down and, like, shot off. And then another guy, another model, has to walk up to it and start packing up the MG. And so even if you fall back an MG, sometimes with, like, two-thirds of its health and three crew members, you can still lose that MG because they just can't get it moving. So, uh... Yeah, um, I was worried for a second there, but he does pull the 50 cal out of the fire there. And it will be a Sherman uh, Easy 8 coming out here. So this, uh, how much does an Easy 8 cost? Uh, da -da -da, whoops. So an Easy 8 is 140 fuel, 380 manpower. So it is in resource equivalent, it is a resource equivalent of a T-3485 or a Panzer IV Aus J with the armoured skirts. Um, and... I mean, it probably performs very well for that, right? Because you get the American vehicle crew, who are always epic, so it's going to be self-repairing and doing loads of great stuff. And it's an Easy 8, right? So doesn't Easy 8 have higher penetration than the T-3485? I could be wrong on that, but I think it does. <laughs> wow, this is a really concentrated blob of folk, so sure, it's sure lucky that there's no mortars falling in or anything. Also lucky that there's no MG. So the Volks Grenadiers in the north, they're setting up some sandbags, but importantly, they get the scout on the Easy 8. So now Korean knows what the enemy is, and Spare Panzer HQ is done. Panzer authorization is about to finish. Is this a good opportunity to build a Jagd Panzer? Yep, that's right. I'm going to really go out of my comfort zone and recommend a tank destroyer here. Uh, but seriously, this looks like actually it could be a really fine spot for a Jagdpanzer build. Um, I feel like your infantry core is so sweet that you can actually kind of deal with the American player for now. And if you had a Jagdpanzer that you could look after this game... Having said that though, this is not the best map for a Jagdpanzer. All of these line of sight blockers and sort of tra traversable light lanes where tanks can move around can really punish you for not having a turret. So perhaps this is actually not a good spot for a Jag Panzer. And Korean is um, going to opt for the Panzer IV, so I think that actually makes a lot of sense. I just, I'm just i not sure that I like trying to compete with the Easy 8 on, e on even footing, but we can always take the Elite Armor Doctrine, actually, and get ex access to the Heat Rounds, and then I then I think the Panzer IV makes a ton of sense. So yeah, this is fine. American player here is um, almost, almost hearing me, it seems. Going to go for a Mortar Squad, so that's pretty good. The Puma isn't very good against the Easy 8. Uh, I mean, you're right. A Vet Zero Puma, for sure, is not very good against the Easy 8. If, if you happen to already have a Vet 3 Puma, you can lean on it to some extent against the Easy 8, because it's going to be hitting and penetrating almost every hit and firing really quick, so that's very annoying for the Easy 8. But even then, you're on thin ice. If that Easy 8 manages to get anywhere near you or connect even a couple of good shots, then that Puma's in severe danger, so... Yeah. Mm -mm. Look at us go! We've got such good viewership. This is insane. For my first week streaming, I'm so happy. It's just ridiculous. Literally on Monday, or was it Tuesday, after I streamed, I just like started watching some random Company of Heroes 2 streamers, and there was this guy streaming with like 15 or 20 people who'd been streaming for like two or three years, and I hung out and watched him for like an hour, and I was like, dude, if I could stream to like 10 or 20 people like on the regular, that would just be epic. I guess in two or three years I could aim to have that, and it's like, wow, no, it's like literally happening like on Wednesday or like we, we've just had ep epic viewership it's just been insane I'm so thanks very much everyone <laughs> um anyway 
We've got a showdown between these two mediums, as the easier is going to start kiting ahead of these Volks Grenadiers. Not set to prioritize vehicles, actually, so I think it actually is wasting that shot targeted at the Volks Grenadier. The Panzer IV is going to keep pushing forwards here, looking to chip damage in. Neither of these tanks at Vet Zero particularly accurate, it appears. Both rolling quite a few misses. This EZ-8 is still firing shots into the infantry, which I'm a little bit skeptical about. Probably you do want to prioritize and wait for the uh, the Panzer IV. So there are, in fact, some little sneaky storm pioneers making a lot of ground down there in south, so that's really nice. Panzer IV going to come in a little bit deeper here. Volksgrenadiers pushing in as well, trying to find a Faust onto the EZ-8. But the MG-34 is going to repulse them, but they kill the M1 AT gun, so that's the most important part of that, and the Panzer IV is getting the, the be upper hand of these trades with the uh, EZ-8, independently of heat ammo as well, which is really nice. 50 cal blazing away at the back here, which American forces, ah, it's making life hell out here, but speaking of making life hell, this mortar just chipping in so much damage, incendiary ammo as well coming down, and the Raketenwerfer is on the chopping block, but he gets that out of there, just, whew, that was a bit sketchy. Uh, going to be using the mechanized um, regiment here for the repairability, so the Panzer II is getting turned around at the moment. But this Panzer IV has been... Oh, it's been so hot! Now he can actually pick off the hardware. Uh, American Force is trying to regrab the M1 AT gun, but uh, Volks Grenadiers with STGs and stacks of veterancy. Look how quickly Volks bet up if you get them the STGs early. Like, it's brutal. Uh, so yeah, Mortar's continuing to rein in. Perhaps the jingle should be a zany magpie rap. Perhaps, I mean, there is scope for the jingle being, like, a, a sort of zany background track, but I can't have the same rap every day. I would have to rap, like, live over that and, like, change it up or else it would get really stale really fast. But, I mean, I would never say that I was a good rapper, but I, <laughs> I'm up for giving it a try. Um, I do find it quite fun just trying to put words over a beat. Like, it is entertaining. I, I do enjoy it. Um... Okay, look at this pressure that Korean is putting on. Able to dominate the, uh, able to dominate the doorstep of the uh, of the base here. Oh yeah, Datton pointing out the Easy Eight getting some bounces on the uh, Panzer IV, and that that could I mean that Panzer IV does have five percent more armor protection. I forgot about that. God, D Datton, you're good at thinking in terms of bulletins, man. I still just forget about them even being a part of the game. Anyway, the Panzer II here is in danger. There are Zooks on the, or one Zook at least, on the captain. Uh, it's kiting for now. It's probably going to be able to get out of there safely, to be honest. Um, but that's going to have to fall back and repair. Now, here comes the Easy 8 The Panzer is not on 100% health, and there's a second Easy 8 coming, actually. Korean's still a ways off of getting a second Panzer IV, so there's going to be quite a long window of time here, like several minutes, where it's going to be two Easy 8s versus a single Panzer IV. Flammenwerfers, or flamethrowers, these are American units, uh, getting up on top of the uh, Raketenwerfer, and uh, that will be a kill there, although the, the Americans have to fall back, so the Axis units will be able to recrew that piece of hardware, and that's important. With a second EZ-8 coming out, you want both your Raketenwerfers here. <clears throat> An entire cast in improv rap form. That sounds difficult. It won't be the norm. Ah! Um, uh, relatively sh sure it's not been done before. That's why it's going to be cool and not a bore. Ah! Keep them coming, boys. <laughs> Uh, so let's crack the tack here for a second. The American hardpoint is still established right here, but it is uncomfortably far back. And this last phase of play has been sort of characterized by Axis domination. Um, the American player just wants to be able to push and hold the midline of the map. This is too far back to be holding, so a plucky unit of, uh, of uh, rear echelon here going to make their way onto central VP. Magpie, a company of heroes musical. <laughs> yeah. There's just the idea of that is just hilarious. Sorry, my mind is racing away with the possibilities. That's just that's just very funny. Um, so tentatively here, and with the two easy eights, it does seem like Fire and Terror is able to make up some of the ground they need. Now, if we can push up the Mortar Squad and the, uh, the MG34 a little bit, that would be really nice. Um, the scoreline here, actually, that's the real story that I've not even talked about yet. Which is that, actually, how are the American forces winning this hard, actually? I did not realize that, wow, actually, Korean, for all the military domination, is really on the back foot on the scoreline. This is a problem. Holy spoons, I didn't actually realize that he's like 300 points off the pace. Jesus. Okay, so actually, sorry, uh, there is considerable pressure on Korean right now to not die. Um, Korean is going to have to 
be a little bit ballsy here. We cannot be bleeding any more tickets because a game that Korean wins from here is probably going to go on for quite a long time. So every ticket is going to be crucial. Hmm, this is a problem and we're back under the clock. If I replaced all the... Vi <laughs> That's a terrible idea! Okay, Emma Duranke there. That is really interesting. If I replaced all of the voice files in this game with my own voice. Here's a funny thing. So a long time ago, when I was in school, my friends and I, we used to play Quake 3 Arena. And one of my friends and I, we made... Um, we, we modded the game where we replaced all of the sound files in Quake 3 Arena, or at least most of them, with us doing a voiceover of the sound file. So like Rocket Launcher was literally me going whoosh, and the rocket explosion was it going like boom. And um, the machine gun noise was just one of us going like daka. So when, it, when you hold fire on the machine gun, it's like daka 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 daka. Like, my God, it was stupid, but it was really fun. That was some juvenile magpie antics. Um, so these easy eights continuing to continuing to find value. Kettenworth is doing their best to hold them back. Uh, looks like Korean's going to get out from under the clock, and there's a lot of combat going on here. So keep your eyes peeled, because there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of units in jeopardy. Combat here in the middle of the map, as the 50 cow and the Kettenworth are pushing forwards. Volk's Gonadir is going to get up on top of middle VP, and this is crucial. Korean does need to maintain control over these VPs. Uh, if somehow Fire and Terror can threaten the southern VP, that would be really, really scary. Yeah, A-game, it was hilarious. Um, huh. Dan, you're so clutch with your analysis, man. That's how the Americans got off to such a huge fuel boost. They didn't research vehicle requisition. They just stuck to the weapon teams. That's so smart. That is so smart. Yeah, that's how the American was able to leapfrog so quickly into Major Tech. We've got huge fights coming down here. Panzer IV's blazing. Raketenwerf is sh launching shots into these easy eights. And look at the Panzer IVs hiding in super cunning places. They just don't want to be taking easy eight rounds. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but was the easy eight? That was like an 88 millimeter, right? That was like a proper huge AT gun. That would make Panzer IVs very scared. They were just like, oh, our Shermans aren't beating Panzer IVs. Let's just put a huge gun on it, right? That was the idea. And then the Brits took it one stage further with the Firefly kind of thing. Actually, with well, the Firefly was just an easy eight at the, in, under the British designation. Am I right on that? I feel like it was. Anyway, Rakettenwerfer gets the kill on one of the easy eights. Really nice. Panzer IV is coming around this line of sight blocker to start stacking some damage on. And I wonder if this other easy eight could be up on the chopping block next. There is an M1 AT gun providing some cover here as the Stuka operation, the Sector Assault, comes down. So perhaps this is why people are picking the Overwatch Doctrine. This is quite the munitions dump. 250 providing an extended period of airborne domination as the JU-88s are going to strafe all over the place, gunning down infantry and hooning on vehicles. Um, massive fights going down. Volksgrenadiers have been neglected. A four-star squad, a four man, a four star squad of Volksgrenadiers being neglected because there's so much to be microing right now. Microing two pounds of fours and a load of other squads. In fact, he's lost a lot of his core infantry here, has Korean. And then the game ends. Uh, okay. It is actually not immediately clear who has left the game there. Normally you get a skull icon and a disconnect symbol. Uh, but one has to assume that's Fire and Terror who's left the game because they've lost all of their easy eights, so there's no answer for the Panzer Fours. Yeah, yeah, okay, clearly that's the American player conceding. Sorry, threw me for a second there because I wasn't expecting the game to end so abruptly. But yeah, that is GG. If you lose all of your anti-tank resources and your opponent has three Panzers, that's GG. An amazing game, to be honest. Uh, 28 minutes and 15 seconds of intense fighting and high-level micro. Korean and Fire and Terror did not disappoint in this one. That was just a fantastic game, and I really like the way it panned out with the Axis forces having a 50 cal and the Americans having the MG34, both of which went on to get decent amounts of veterancy and like be quite pivotal in that game. Um, so Overwatch Doctrine here definitely did provide the final nail in the coffin with the Sector Assault. I mean, absolutely, it was useful there. Um... Is it the Sector Assault? No, Breakthrough Doctrine gets something different, doesn't he? Um, yes, the upkeep is crazy in Company of Heroes 2. It's one of the biggest balancing factors. It is, you know that feeling? Sometimes you get it in Company of Heroes 2 where like one of the players is so heavily behind but then somehow manages a turnaround in the late game and it's really, it's often because the player with the upper hand just can't afford to reinforce or replace their squads and that's huge. That is a huge part of the game and it really sort of 
channels into the um, World War II aesthetic because, it, you know, the armies start feeling exhausted. You're desperate for manpower just when you're about to win. Uh, now, I just wanted to quickly check OKW Commander's Breakthrough Doctrine. Here he is. Um, hmm. Yeah, he gets the assault artillery. So does anybody else get the um, the sector assault? There it is. Okay, nobody else gets the sector assault. So perhaps this is why people are taking Overwatch Doctrine. Because you do get some good infantry, you get some useful other things. And it is the only commander with sector assault. I actually didn't know that. <coughs> so there we go. Yeah, it's like anti-snowball tech, indeed. Okay, let's hop into the live game lobby, see what we can see. El Padre versus a different Korean. Come on, give me a Soviet game. Animal Killer and I Mean IT Band, but that one doesn't actually start for a little while. Toilet Guy and Prabuti, uh-huh, uh-huh. Let's have a look in the custom games. Uh, did it sort by viewers. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, there's no names that are leaping off the page for me here. Pardon me. Uh, so what do we think, guys? Are we okay? What do we want? Do we want Vermac versus USF on Fame and Villa Approach? Or... Oh, we've got a Soviets game here. This is a risk, though, because I don't know either of these players. Mm, what's going on in 2v2? Good question. Asher Blois and Seeking the Guy. I mean, Asher Blois is clearly a very good player. I mean, if that's the real Asher Blois. But I am. I, I kind of prefer 1v1, unless it's like literally Helping Hands, because I've wanted to cast Helping Hands forever, and he does play a lot of 2v2. Yeah, but I don't think Hands is online right now. I am kind of inclined to go for this Soviet game. Uh, sorry this Soviet game and just kind of give it a look. Let's go with some Soviets. Why would I want to cast hands? Why would I not want to cast hands? <laughs> I think hands is awesome. Okay, we're gonna jump into the Soviets on Langriskaya. <clears throat> it's just how I feel. You know what, actually, whilst we're doing this, in the meantime, we've had some follows while I've been offline. So let's give them a shout out, because um, we've got a little bit of downtime here. So uh, what does that say? We've got... I need a darker background. Let's wait for the load. Let's wait for the game to load up a second, because I actually can't read those follows on that background. Oh, there's no ISU-152, Commander. Rawr! Language Sky is such a good map for the ISU-152. Okay, there we go. Now I can read it. So, we've got some follows from Ziswen. Thank you very much, Ziswen. You're a legend. Thank you very much for following. That's uh, awesome. If you're there in chat, if you catch this on the VODs, you're much appreciated. We've got um, Striker1306. Thank you very much for following while I've been offline. That's uh, that's awesome and very much appreciated. Uh, we've got uh, Streaming Mini. Thank you very much. From Streaming Magpie to Streaming Mini. Really appreciated. And we've got Koksu00. Thank you very much for your follow. That is means a lot. Somehow we're getting follows and growing the channel in week one. I am just, this is beyond my wildest expectations. Um, so it's just amazing. Thank you very much for all the love. It's awesome. Let's go ahead and introduce these two players. Wow, we've got two not super out there, but lesser spotted commanders here. Spawning in the north, playing as the Vermac pieces. It's going to be Kanji. This is obviously Chinese, but I'm just calling them Kanji. Uh, and they're going to be running with the Assault Support Doctrine. So this is one of my favourite lesser spotted commanders, because you get the Artillery Field Officer, who may not be good, but is very fun. Um, and isn't bad. You get the Cargo Truck, you get the Strafing Run, both really useful. I mean, the Cargo Truck is out there in terms of what it does. There's not much in the game that does what that thing does. Uh, you get the Fragmentation Bomb, and you get the Tiger Tank. Amazing late-game stuff. Uh, and spawning in the South playing as the Soviets, we've got Kraskin85. Um, so going for a techless opener right now on conscripts, going for the armored assault er, commander here. So we get the radio intercepts, very useful. We get the T-3485, a decent upgrade. We get the vehicle crew, decently useful. We get the IL-2 Sturmvik attack, that's absolutely great. But it's especially powerful in combination with the IS-2 heavy tank, because if you are 
playing against a Tiger tank, which we could see this game, then the combination of IS-2 plus the um the IL-2 attack, this is the expensive one, this is 180 munitions, this is the one where it just like continuously dackers things down, and those 23mm cannons can and do deal damage, good damage, to Tiger tanks, then it can just swing a fight where you wouldn't otherwise have been able to kill the Tiger. It's a little bit like the upgrade of the rocket run sort of thing, so yeah. Um, yeah, I hope that we get an artillery field officer as well. That would be really sweet. Uh, pretty standard tech here so far from the uh, Axis player. MG42 uh, backing up a couple of squad of Grenadiers. Uh, looks like the Soviet player kind of coming around the west flank here. Coming from a slightly unexpected angle. Going to get a fairly nice engage into these Grenadiers to kick things off. And that is nice. Actually firing from a, a place where they won't be getting the cover, I believe, there as well. There we go. The um, Grenadiers going to reposition there. Um... Yeah, Soviet forces doing Soviet things, moving out across the map. He's actually stacking some manpower here, and I don't know why. Uh, we are used to seeing four squads of conscripts or two squads of engineers. So that is a strange time to be stacking manpower. MG42 is going to catch these Soviet units under arc, but not before they grab the cutoff. So that's very important there. Really nicely done. The engineers are going to fall back, and I'm hoping that they're going to go and build the support weapon Campania, because as I've said many times on the channel, it does make me a little bit uneasy when Soviet players elect to play too long without the support weapon Campania. And Langriskaya is a map that very much rewards machine guns, and Maxims are very useful. It also, Langriskaya is a very good map for mortars, because it's so small, you can usually have those mortars in very safe places, able to hit all of your opponent's units and put smoke just where you need it, because the map is so small. I mean, look, there's basically like three screens between your base and your opponents. This is a small map. Um, so, yep, yeah, oof, conscripts doing conscript things. Absolutely. This is this is what we like. But he's stacking so much manpower. This is not a commander that gives you access to guards. Support weapon Campania comes down, so maybe he just wants to go like double Maxim, just have the manpower for that. I don't know. But even then... Maxims take a while to build, right? So I still feel like you could have squeezed out a squad of conscripts and still gone straight for double Maxim, more or less. I don't know. I feel like this is not the most efficient way to have done things, and like the, the little part of my brain which has spent so long playing StarCraft is just like, your build doesn't line up! These timings are off! Wah! And in Company Periods 2, it's a lot less important. It just has a lot less impact on the game, but like, I've just played too much StarCraft for these things to not scream in my head, basically. Um... Conscript's possibly your favourite unit, Emma Duranke. I mean, I cannot blame you. They're so versatile. They're so interesting. And I really like Conscripts, actually, because they have such pronounced strengths, and then also, some of the time, they feel like they cannot do anything. Like, they are just dying everywhere. So they really... I like units that have pronounced strengths and weaknesses, and Conscripts definitely fit that envelope. So, anyway, we've got Panzer Grenadiers being mixed into the roster here for Chinese... Uh, sorry, for um, Kanji. Uh, field control kind of going slightly towards the Soviet player. 36 ticket lead, nothing to write home about. Basically what we're used to seeing. Uh, yeah, the conscript, re the conscript merge ability to like reinforce the other squads is... It just lets your Zis guns and your Maxims keep firing, and that's what you want them to be doing. So, yeah, when the conscripts are not useful directly in combat, you can use them to like be on the field healing, in a way, for your other units, which is great. And like when I play Soviets, I usually, not always, but usually I run with a commander who gives you guards infantry, because I just find it hard to play without an elite infantry squad who has access to some really nice kind of LMG unit, because I'm so used to playing Axis. So, um... I uh, I usually use guards to bolster my conscripts, and then the conscripts are basically just on like capturing support, merging, and salvaging duty, like scavenging duty. Whereas, uh, and then the guards do most of the heavy lifting with like you know pinging enemy vehicles and uh, laying into them with laying into infantry with DPS. Um, <clears throat> a good Lego piece. That is a good. De that is a good description of conscripts. Absolutely, artillery field officer. Yeah, we got it, boys. We got it. The artillery field officer is out there and girls. This is an equal opportunity channel and other genders, whatever. If you identify as a squid, then you are so welcome here. It's cool. Um, uh, so, yeah, so the artillery field officer is out. Let's refresh ourselves, or at least refresh myself, because I. this is one of those like semi-complicated units that has some abilities, that, oh, and it, there's some overlap with like storm officers and various other things, so I'd like always forget exactly who, what, who gets what. So we've got diversion. Taking the lead, the officer will command his units to draw bundle grenade, to draw fire, to create a diversion. Those conscripts need to get the hell out of there. Our brave infantry is dying. What did he just lose? Oh god, he just lost the artillery officer. Oh no. <laughs> no! 
no, that's not how we wanted it to happen. Oh, I didn't even get to read through the uh, read through the other stuff. Gender is a spectrum, but I haven't seen squids on that scale. Trust me, they're on that scale. Look, I'm I'm representing the cephalopods today. It's what we got going on. Um, so we've got the opal fuel truck that's coming out here. So what this thing does is it just sits on points and down, uh, then you, you lock it down and it generates additional fuel income. But it is a liability. It will die to like pretty much a stiff breeze. So you have to look after it. You do have to babysit it. But there's very few things in the game that do generate extra resources and they normally have to be balanced very strictly. And the opal blitz is the only one of those things that moves. So it's really interesting. It's a very interesting piece. Time was, this commander, like, I'm talking years ago in the early stages of this game, this commander was literally OP, and the Opal Blitz was adjusted heavily uh, because players were just abusing it, mostly in 2v2 and above, but players were abusing the hell out of it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, did it just... Yes, yes, the officer did just die. Uh, is the officer visible this patch? I would love to check, but the officer has died. <laughs> so we just don't know. This Soviet army is so small... He's gone for the tanker V, and this will be a T-70. This has to be a T-70. Yeah, okay, so it's a T-70 build. All right. This army is still really small. I feel like he's one squad off the pace. Like, he needs to have an, a mortar or a second maxim or a fourth conscript squad in this army for me to be happy. I don't know why he's just banking one squad's worth of manpower, but, ah, you know... This is this is just me complaining up here in my cast to see. This, this opal... I really wonder, so how much extra income does it generate nowadays? That's what I want to know. Does anyone know? Anyone in chat? How much extra income does the Opal Blitz generate? That would be really interesting to figure out. Oh, Datton. God damn it, Datton. You are on point, man. Yeah, Datton pointing out super valid. The radio intercepts will have revealed that there is an Opal Blitz. So even though the Soviet player hasn't scouted it, we know it's out there, which means that the T-70, a fast-moving unit which is perfect for picking off an Opal Blitz truck, can hunt it down. Yeah, absolutely. That's sick. That's really cool. LMG-42s are on these Grenadiers now, and they are out-muscling these conscripts, like, pretty handily. Panzer Grenadiers on the chopping block. That'll be a squad wipe. Boom! So, this German player losing quite a lot of value in the early stages of this game, and that's a problem. The artillery field officer costs 240 manpower, so that's how much that one was. Uh, and now we can see the uh, the T-70 is just looking like... Oh, he's in um, observation mode. Like, where is this? Where is this? Where is this Opal Blitz? Uh, Maxim here going to be finding a lovely position. A couple of grenadier squads under the arc here. Possibly a rifle grenade could come down to try and just shove this away. Uh, T-70 is going to start chipping in from the side here. And uh, things going swimmingly for the Soviet player. Connecting up the western fuel as well, which has uh, been in been blue for a while now. Pack gun is here, though. The pack gun to not die, coming out just in the nick of time. And that's going to start putting some fatty holes into this T-70. Um, yeah, if he caught the alert, that's a good point. It used to double the points value. Okay, so it's generating an extra plus three fuel and plus five munitions every tick. And the Opal Blitz truck costs 200 manpower. Wow, that's really cheap. Imagine if it could like reinforce as well. Oh, how good would that be? I mean, I know that there's the other commander who gets the Opal truck, which can reinforce and transport units, but like, this would be such a cool forward fallback point. I know it'd be OP as hell. But I would still love it. I think Vermax. You know what? No, I was gonna. I was gonna make a comment about the balance of the game, and I'm gonna think better of it. I was gonna say I think Vermax need a little bit of help, and and it's not because I feel like they are having a hard time against allies. I actually feel like it's the internal balance against the other Axis faction. I think actually OKW are just maybe better. I don't know. It's just kind of how I feel. I think um, I think if you play Vermax, you are super heavily dependent on your commander to bring some extra spice. Um, let's put it that way. Whereas I feel like OKW are more self-contained. Anyway, this uh, Soviet player is really shoving uh, good old Kanji around here. Oh, what? Creative name. You can literally see it on the minimap. Uh, I don't think Radio Intercepts lets you see things on the minimap, does it? 
Oh, the sector on the Opal Blitz. Yeah, that too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So it's not it's not about radio intercept. Yeah, so yeah, you can see it lit up on the map. So yeah, the Soviet player will know where that uh, where that Opal Blitz is. That's really uh, interesting. Yeah, you see the white outline. Yeah, okay, cool. Oh, that's pretty interesting stuff. All right, so it looks like finally the Axis player is going to get some boots onto these VPs, decapping two of them, and that's going to help because he's down at 327 under 479, and we're not that far into this game. So things are heading in... Whoa, nice bundle grenade. Things heading in a slightly precarious direction, perhaps. Let's quickly check the tech. No mechanized regiment, Campania, yet. Um, he's stacking a 1,000 manpower. I'm so confused. You can't, you can't realistically be stacking a thousand manpower. Have we had a follow? PFCO2. You've just followed in the most recent times. Oh my god. Okay, so I spent some time, time trying to get the follow alerts to work, and they are still not working, for which I apologize. I disabled them, I re-enabled them, I changed things around. I don't know what the deal is. Possibly I'm going to have to switch to a different service provider for these alerts. Because um, I'm running out of ideas as to exactly what can be. It's weird because all the follows work and it works when I press test follow, but it's not coming through. So I'm really sorry that when people press follow, it's not popping up. It's super annoying. Um, so anyway, yeah, uh, PFCO2, thank you very much. Your follow is super appreciated. And even though it's not popping up on the stream, I noticed. Um, PFCO2 is Asia Mint. Oh, sick. Dude, Asia Mint, welcome to the stream. Nice to have you aboard. Um, we've cast a couple of your games recently, as it happens. Um, you can catch the VODs at youtube.com slash magpie842. Um, yeah, we caught a couple of your games recently. Thanks very much, by the way. Really exciting to watch. Some great games. Um... So yeah, it looks like a conscript ball out here in west going to be too much for these grenadiers to handle. Panzer IV comes down onto the queue. Soviet player is managing to spend a bit more of their manpower. We do have the mechanized armor campanaya. Uh, so yeah, I mean, are we just building up a manpower bank so that we're going to be ready for the IS-2 when, when it's there? I mean, it's still a long way away. And I feel like you kind of need the boots on the ground right now, but I don't know. Kraskin is definitely a better player than I am because they're at the top of the live game ladder, so... You know, I trust their judge. <laughs> we got over here just in time to see the T-70 get a triple kill with that cannon round. And that will be the squad wipe on the Pioneers, so that's annoying. The Axis player has to spend what little manpower they have left immediately replacing that. Here comes the Panzer IV, uh, factory fresh in a rather unpainted state, rushed out here um, onto the Eastern Front to help deal with these Soviets. And uh, a Zis gun will be added into the roster, probably just in the nick of time to start helping. Uh, Anti-vehicle grenades are not done. Wow, that's a little bit of an oversight. Hmm. Wow, we're nearly 15 minutes into this game and we have not got anti-vehicle grenades. Err. Hmm. I feel like we should have those. Well, he's going to realize as soon as he sees this Panzer IV, he's going to be like, Oh, anti-vehicle grenades, I don't have them. Um, yeah, floating 1k manpower just for the BM, potential. <laughs> like, sure. That's what you want to do. Be my guest. I'm always about trying to win, though. <laughs> Lobby was sorted by viewers? Oh. That's my bad. I did change it. I thought I changed it back. Oh, God. All right. Well, we're just going to catch some mid-level play here. Yeah, it really does show you're right. Lol. Remember the time when Magpie, Magpie forgot to resort by other, other type? And we ended up casting just some random game. But hey, we're seeing an Opal Blitz truck. There's some cool stuff going on. But yeah, that does explain a lot of what we see in this game. Like the artillery field officer going down and like all this stuff. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good point from A-Game. That is probably why we see a lot of Korean games. Because I cast at midday in England, which is the evening time in Korean. In Korea. Uh, so that is actually, that does explain why I see a lot of Koreans on the ladder. Huh, I never realized that. They don't take long to research. Yeah, you're right, but they're still not coming down. <laughs> oh dear. It's going to be a T-3485 here for Kraskin. Yeah, 
Yeah, look, look, look at the way... Okay, so this is... You know what we can do? I mean, this is not a useless cast, though. I mean, obviously, I do prefer to, cop the, to, to cast the top-rated games. And clearly, I've sorted the lobby incorrectly, for which I do apologize. But, you know, we do get to... There is a useful intellectual exercise to be performed here, and that is that we can compare and contrast. Like, how does this game differ from the last? Well, look... And I know, it's, I know we've got different factions. Um, you know, we've got Soviets here still, but... Look at the way the Soviet player is moving their units. You know, they're just kind of it looks like they're maybe band selecting or something they're kind of like moving them out in more blobby ways less slightly less specifically slightly less purposefully um here comes that t3485 now so that one's going to rock out here uh, the axis player still very much struggling to control the field conscript squad here will be wiped out uh, the panzer four unlikely to take prisoners here oh hang on Whew. How does that conscript get away? And it looks like uh, Kanji actually not paying attention, not alert there on the pursuit. Second artillery field officer has been bought. So quick, before he loses it, let's look at the abilities. You get the uh, diversion. The officer will command his unit to draw fire to create a diversion. That's crazy. I've just never seen that used, I don't think. Artillery smoke barrage. Uh, so that is a free ability. No munitions cost. Crazy. Inspiring aura. Motivate nearby soldiers and vehicle crews to fight harder. That's pretty cool. Infantry fire with greater accuracy and vehicles fire faster. That's great. A fire speed buff for 25 munitions? Interesting. I wonder how big the um, radius is. Um, diversion isn't that good for 25 munitions, but all the other abilities are great. Okay. Diversion certainly sounds interesting. It does make the squad more difficult to hit and fire more accurately. Yeah, 25 munitions seems like a lot. It sort of is dependent on your opponent taking the bait as well. Like, you're not getting much value out of it if they don't fire at the artillery field officer. So, yeah. Is this gun in mid going to get flustered? Uh, Axis forces are able to push up a little bit here. And these two players are being pretty static. I tell you what, I'm just wondering, well anyway, the Soviet player's going to be pushing here, I'm just wondering, has anyone got Company of Heroes 2 open? If someone's got Company of Heroes 2 open and they can check the live game lobby, sort it by ranked, because if there are two good players playing right now, I would probably switch to casting them. I don't know if anyone could do that, that would be super useful, um, just because this is just not the most dynamic game. Like, these two players are just playing kind of slowly. Um, and without too much sort of... Without too much coordination. Um, I mean, I'm hesitant to switch right before... I mean, but we don't have the fuel for IS-2, so we're actually a ways off seeing some cool units as well. So, yeah, if anyone could just quickly scan the 1v1 lobby, I would love that. That would be really useful. I don't often bail on a cast halfway through, but I kind of mistakenly cast this game, so, like... That, that would that would be cool. Uh, Stindy is playing a top 100 game right now. Stindy, that doesn't ring a bell. Who's Stindy then? If you could shed some light on that, that would be really sweet. Uh, but they're playing even slower. I Fair enough. How has this Opal Blitz truck not been touched, by the way? That is like, that's like ridiculous. Okay, so here comes, what is this? Oh, this is the Isle 2 Sturmovic attack. Oh my god. That was a fragmentation bombing run that was a double kill on units. He got the Maxim and the Zis. But here comes the IS-2s. Oh god, they are rinsing this infantry. Immediately pinning and suppressing, doing a lot of stuff. This is 180 munitions, yep. Yeah. Uh, the frag bombing run is also 180, so that's interesting. Uh, okay, this Soviet army has been like, heavily devastated. He desperately needs to get some conscripts over here to re-grab these units. The tanks will defend for now, but the pack gun is picking them down. The Zis gun has been destroyed already, and then, uh, actually, he's going to push with the pack gun, not the Panzer Grenadiers? What are we doing here? Panzer IV is in the hood, and that's going to try and get the kill on the Maxim here. Conscripts are going to hastily grab that to prevent the hardware from being destroyed. Ostindy is the angry Dutchman. Okay, interesting. But if they're playing even slower, I don't know. Um, this game is just about warming up now, so we'll see. If, if, if there is just another, like, super sick game on the ladder, though, please do let me know. Um, so we got... Uh, this Soviet assault is kind of just being blunted, and without the Zis gun... Oh, he's going up to two T-3485s. That is pretty credible. 
Uh, but the Axis player is going to have access to their heavy tank first, having been stockpiling fuel towards this Tiger for some time now. Question is, can they survive against two T-3485s as Conscript's getting gunned down on the retreat here? Can they survive against two T-3485s? Oh my god, this Conscript... This Soviet player is kind of out of units here. This is kind of risky. Jin is a Dutch first name. Wow, I've never heard of that name. All right, so the T-34s are going to rumble on forwards here, uh, blasting Germans and trying to do what they can, but Priority's vehicle is not on the lead T-34, so it's actually wasting shots into infantry rather than trying to get some damage on that uh, Panzer IV. Pat Gun is still active right now, tracking onto the healthy uh, T-3485 for a moment here. But this is getting pretty risky. The Pat Gun does go down. And these two T-34s are blazing away. Oh, goodness me. Do we not want to micro them back? Oh, God. This is a lot of AT-related damage. One of the T-34s goes down. And it looks like the other one will shortly go down as well. The Pat Gun can re-aim. The Panzer IV is still here. He gets the Pat Gun, but it's not enough. The armored skirts are on this Panzer IV. <gasps> a lucky bounce. Going to save this uh, um, T-3485 for now. But this Soviet player is out of gas. He's got nothing left. Um, he's just out of gas. Uh, so I imagine, as the dust settles on this one, that, uh, I mean, I think we can just go ahead and call that game, to be honest. I mean, this game's going to trudge on a bit, but I don't imagine the Soviet player will stabilize. So I think we're just going to call that game there. I think that's probably about as cinematic of a fight that we're going to get out of this game. Uh, go, go eight times speed? Yeah, sure. But I mean, I think we're going to catch up to reality. Uh... So the Panzer IV gets uh, stricken, the Stuka, sorry, the IL-2s come back in, uh, suddenly all of the Axis stuff is dying, Soviet player sort of stabilizing, Conscript's coming out. Uh, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff is happening, Soviet player is desperately trying to stabilize, the Axis player is still hemorrhaging value, this looks pretty scary, eight times casting for the win. Uh, both of the Soviet mediums continuing to persist. The Panzer IV now repaired. Katusha actually going to be the next choice here. Tiger tank rumbles out onto the field, and there is no real answer for this. The Soviet player is desperately rebuying a Zis gun. Uh, Tiger tank posturing around in mid. I kind of wish that the Axis player knew just how far ahead they were, because if they did, I feel like we'd see them come in for the KO blow. Uh, Soviet forces coming under the cover of smoke to try and recapture mid, but it won't be enough. Um, and the Tiger tank is going to kind of awkwardly reverse with just exposing side armor here. And... Uh, we are catching up to reality here. Um, uh, so the Psycho Tank's going to repair in situ. Uh, Panzer IV on the flank here, doing what it can. But the Soviet player has kind of rebuilt an army, and now we've actually got IS-2 out. So now it's IS-2 versus Tiger, as I bring it back to one-time speed. Uh, somehow the game has come back to parity, which kind of does often happen in Company of Heroes 2 when the players aren't, like don't have the killer instinct or the um, coordination to kind of like leverage such a huge advantage but I am being critical of the players it's also Langriskaya like Langriskaya is notoriously hard to close a game on, it is very difficult to close out a game um yeah yeah okay alright well, they're just playing so statically I mean, look at this unit movement. All right. The reality is this game could probably... Okay, oh, we've got a big tank battle here going on in eight times speed. We're just going to let it roll here. The IS-2 utterly stricken, outnumbered and outgunned by a Panzer IV and a tank tank. That one will go down. Now the uh, the uh, IL-2s come in, but the Soviet player is basically out of units. And that's game! There we go. Nice one. All right. Okay, thanks very much for bearing with that one, everybody. I forgot to resort the uh, the lobby by, by, by player rank. So we ended up casting some rando 2v2. I had fun. We got to see an Opal Blitz truck, and we did see an IS-2 versus Tiger Tank showdown. Technically, all of those things are accurate. So, let's remember to sort the lobby correctly this time, and we will jump into another one. So, what have we got here? Uh, sort by ranking. There we go. So, we got uh, Mr. Nobody and uh, Japanese. This is a player who I've cast before, though. That's a Soviet game, so I'm tempted. I'm tempted. I'm tempted. Let me know your thoughts in chat. Uh, we've got um, four res versus TR's pineapple the fruit dude. Who is this? I don't know, but that's probably going to be a banger of a game as well. So that's OKW and um, USF. 
Uh, and then we've got the Angry Dutchman. So that's um, that's um, Stjin, who we've all been talking about, Stjin. And I Mean IT Band. That is three good games to choose from. That is three good games. So let me know your thoughts here in chat. Uh, Queen Ratchet, would love to see four rares. Um, there's only one of these games has Soviets in though, right? No, two of them have Soviets in, but not the one with four rares. Ooh. <laughs> um, because most of the people are from Eastern Asia. Yeah, I mean, sure. So, okay, so we've got Mr. Nobody, we've got the Angry Dutchman, and we've got four rares. Those are the choices. Give me some help here, guys. We've got three good games to cast. What's the choice? There's a lot of love for four rares coming out. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Four res versus pineapple. Yeah, sure. If I sound reticent to cast it, it's because it doesn't have Soviets in, but I must put my fanboyism to the side. Not every game can have an ISU 152 in it. All right, so um, if anybody else wants to chip in their preferences, I'll give you just another couple of seconds here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a Duranky. Do Soviets. Yes. Yes. Um... Every game should have an ISU 152. You know it. I haven't cast four res for ages. And the nobody game doesn't begin for a moment. And apparently this game with um, the Angry Dutchman is really slow. So, I think we're just going to cast the four res game. The decision is made. Bear with me, guys. Sorry, just checking my messages here, making sure everything's okay at work. Seems to be good as this game loads in. Okay. They have the infantry bulletins. They must be high-level players. The true mark of a high-level player, for sure. Spawning in the south here as the Overcommand West pieces. It's going to be four res. And spawning in the north, playing as the American forces, it'll be TR's Pineapple the Fruit Dude, who we're just going to call Pineapple. And it has actually been quite a while since I cast a game on this map. In fact, it's been so long that the map name evades me off the top of my head. Does it tell you the map name in these stats or anything? Novigrad Outskirts. There we go. We're on Novigrad Outskirts. I just couldn't remember the name for a moment. Um, so, okay, here we go. Let's see what these two players are going to be bringing to the table. Pineapple the Fruit Dude going to go ahead and pick the Airborne Company Commander straight away. And this is definitely one of the most exciting American Commanders because it lets you tech in interesting ways. You have access to the 50 cal and the M1AT gun in tech-independent, com uh, commander-dependent ways. Uh, so that basically lets you tech however you want, but still have access to the M1 AT gun, which is massive, really. Um, or the 50 cal if you want to go captain first, but usually we see lieutenant first, and then we see the power dropped M1 AT guns if they're needed. Um, and that's a powerful thing to do. Of course, you also get access to paratroopers and pathfinders, who are very useful, and the, uh, the good old P47 rocket strafe, which is just horrible for allied player sorry for axis players to deal with it's um it's really sticky once they lock onto one of your tanks they will keep hammering it with rockets and it's one of the few commanders who i actually think that you kind of do need some form of anti-air defense to just cut down the efficiency of those damn mustangs so um uh, novograd is a city in the north of current day ukraine it is yeah i think it is uh, so here we go, the uh, Pathfinders are coming out onto the field, Springfield at the ready. Kubelwagen build here for Forez, whose uh, Storm Pioneers are getting hammered down by Riflemen a bit, but Volks Grenadiers should be able to avenge them here. So these two players get to grips with each other. 
we'll have a look at the commanders that Forez is rocking. So we've got the Overwatch Doctrine, which we've seen be powerful today. It turns out that Sector Assault ability is quite good. We've got the Luftwaffe Ground Forces Doctrine. And we've got the Grand Offensive Doctrine. Oh no, Rifleman on the chopping block. The Kubelwagen is here. Is he going to pursue? Oh, they get rinsed. That is a pretty damn good start there, to be honest, for the OKW player. Anytime you can wipe out a Rifleman squad within three minutes, that is going to be a hard game for the American player now. So... We will see exactly what Forez is able to get done now. But uh, this is kind of like... I was going to make a sports metaphor, a sports analogy. But you know when a player gets sent off and the other team just has more to work with? It's, it's like that. Um, yeah, three American squads versus five Axis units is quite the disparity. And we're being generous and counting the rear ash as an actual squad. Which, I mean, they sort of are until they get into a fight. So this is going to be a tough, a tough one here for Pineapple. But, you know, you can definitely recover from this. Airborne, Airborne Company gives you some tools, gives you some, some toys to play with. Uh, but that's a harsh start. It's a triple Volks Grenadier now. Everything looking super standard for the OKW player. To be honest, it's not often we see where OKW players do anything too weird in the first few minutes of the game. Unless they go, like, double Kubel or something weird. Like, double Kubel, double Storm Pioneer is a thing that we see from time to time. And it is fun, but it's risky. And yeah, he's just taking fights at the moment. It's going to be Captain first here for Pineapple the Fruit Dude. Interesting. Getting the BAR upgrade as soon as that officer is on the field. So it's going to be bolstering the uh, the roster here. Kubawagen coming in. Uh, going to start decapping this point. Has to give way to the captain. They're going to complete the decap nicely. And uh, we're going to have a indication in a second here as to what the teching intentions are for the OKW player. Yeah, I mean, risky is one word. It is also quite bad. I mean, there's a reason we don't see it often, but I'm racking my brains trying to think of anything weird that OKW players do early. Um, like, there's just not really a lot, to be honest, is there? Yeah. Two Vet 5 Kubals in a 3v3. Jesus. How many kills did they have? That sounds brutal. Vox Grenadier is going to be grabbing the fuel cutoff here as well, so that will deny the fuel income which these Pathfinders have secured. Kubel Wagon on Death's Door, but sneaks away. Storm Pioneer's in a bad way yet again. Kind of feeding veterancy, but they're going to stay to connect this munitions point. There we go. And now they do need to fall back. They desperately do want to fall back. There we go. Just because this BAR toting captain is right on their fallback path, so they are a little bit vulnerable there. It's going to be a mechanized regiment HQ here for our OKW player, so probably going to be Panzer II, possibly into Puma as well. Um... And this seems like a very good map for the wind-up toys, actually. So, I think that's pretty cool. American forces doing their best here, but... This is going to be really difficult. Flak half-track going to be the choice here. And I wonder if he would be, be buying that if he knew that it was a mechanized Reg HQ opener. Probably. I mean, the Flak Half-Track can beat a Panzer too, but I feel like the matchup definitely favours that Panzer. It's definitely easier to find a, a favourable angle with the Panzer too than it is with the uh, Flak Half-Track. Uh, Self-repair on the Kubel Wagons is... Yeah, it's Vet 3. 50 cal going to be moving out onto the field, so that one was airdropped in. Uh, TR Pineapple getting some use out of the Airborne Doctrine there. We're kind of still waiting for this game to get hot, really. Both these players kind of going through the motions, but the Axis player is just dictating the terms right now. And uh, perhaps with the MG and the Flak Half-Track, uh, we'll see Pineapple be a little bit more confident, move out onto the map and be able to find some value. It's going to be difficult. Panzer II is going to finish up momentarily here. And, yeah, American forces are getting a bit more ballsy. We're going to connect up a fuel point for the first time in a while. Actually, if we crack the tack, we can see quite a lot of American forces finding some captures. And the Axis player won't be able to stop them all. So, uh, the Kuba Wagon, though, crucially, just camps out the cutoff, using its faster cutoff speed to be super disruptive and annoying. So that's really annoying. Flak half-track here going to be... Finding a lot of Axis squads, actually. Finding a good amount of value. But this is the problem. The Panzer II can come in and exploit it 
whilst it's uh, whilst it's already fighting. And oh god, this is so rough. Yeah, this seems like an easy job for the Panzer II here. Destroys the main gun, completes the kill. Things kind of going from bad to worse. Losing the first fuel unit for very little return there for this ax for this um, American player, uh, who's going to keep fighting. I think definitely some people would have left the game in frustration there. But, I mean, there's no need to leave the game yet. You still have 393 tickets. You have some time. You still have a decent core infantry roster. This Panzer II is horrendous times, I grant you. But you can you can build an M M1 AT gun. So that is what's happening right now. Um, opting not to para drop one in, which would have cost less manpower. But eaten up what little munitions the American player has. And, you know, munitions income has not been great this game for the American player. The... Uh, Four res has been really good about exploiting the cutoffs and limiting the amount of access to resources that pineapple has been able to have. So this one's really difficult. Look at us go up to 22 viewers, by the way. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Welcome and hello. Really appreciate everybody who's tuning in right now. You guys all rock. Panzer II just chipping in some damage here as uh, the Axis force is going to scramble to undo all the work that the Americans were able to do there. If I crack the tack, you can see basically all the Americans in the base are... Oops, I've just pressed the wrong button. Haha! <laughs> Wait. Ah! <laughs> Everybody just gets a look at my face for a second there. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, as I crack the tack... You can see uh, American forces kind of basically all in the base or on the doorstep of their base. 22 million viewers. Um, oh, wow. There's um, quite a lot of noise happening outside. I hope that's not catching on the mic. But if it is, let me know and I can close the window. Um, and just look at the, the noose here. has just been consistently set up by 4Res. And Pineapple the Fruit Dude in a rough spot. Really up against it. This fuel and munitions income is... A meager subsistence. The sharpening on the camera is turned back on. Yeah, what? Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. Thanks, guys. Wrong scene. Thanks, A game. And we're back. Ah. <laughs> uh, okay, there we go. Look at this. I've been streaming every day this week, and we finally fucked it up. <laughs> it happens. Um. Okay, Volksgrenadier is going to be forced back here. No danger of a squad wipe, though. Uh, it's going to be a stuck as a first. Cool. That's actually a pretty good way of converting early game momentum into, like, closing the door on your opponent. Because the Panzer II, still, like, no American infantry, no American... This M this M1 is not going to destroy the stuck as a first. Not with the Panzer II and loads of German infantry out there. And now the game gets even harder for Pineapple, who's pinned back in their base. And now it's going to be raining huge barrages of explosive rockets every hundred seconds or so. That's horrendous. Um... Yeah. Actually, the webcam's a little high at the moment as well. I don't know if it's, like, somehow moved. Any better? That is a bit better, isn't it? There we go. Uh, okay, yeah, so American Force is just desperately, desperately trapped in this bubble right now. The Stuckers of Fuss was cancelled? Wah! That's so boring! That was a really cool idea! Imagine a stuck as a foos barrage coming in here. Oh Well, he's going to cancel that and go for actual Schwerpanzer HQ tech, which does kind of make some sense. Yeah. Oh. Pineapple the Fruit Dude's just going to GG there. Yeah, lost, lost horrendous amounts of stuff. Okay, well, that was a quick one. No two, no beating about the bush there. Uh, four res is um, as good as I remember. A nice win. So we're going to go back to the live game lobby. Um, we're going to have a look and decide what game to cast. And uh, then I'm going to go and uh, make another cup of tea and just give my voice a quick rest. I've been streaming for almost 90 minutes. Need to stretch the legs. Uh, so let's have a look and see what we got here in terms of games that we can hop into. So on Crossroads, we've got Mr. Nobody and um, uh, Kanji, who's still... That's actually still going on. And that has got Soviets in, so I am super tempted by that. 
The Angry Dutchman and I Mean IT Band, which is probably a fine game, but I've heard is he's, he was playing really slow. Osgiliath and Asurath. But yeah, I'm making the executive decision. We're getting a Soviet game on Crossroads. Let's rock. Let's rock. Sorry, guys. Ah, this channel ain't a democracy. Or at least not all the time. And I'm just I'm making the call. We're casting Soviets. Come on. Oh, there's no ISU 152 commander. Again. Wah. <laughs> but uh oh well. So we'll wait for this game to load in, then I'll uh then I'll pause it, and then I'm gonna take a quick break so I can just whack the kettle on and uh make sure that no one needs my attention at work. I do have a message here that I just need to quickly follow up on, so but I won't be long, don't worry. Um so here we go, we're gonna load in. There it is, very nice. Da -da -da. Cool. Okie dokie. So if we pause this one. Um, what time is it now? So oh, let's get my watch. So it's 25 past. I will see you guys at, if we say 35 minutes past the hour. So that gives me just a bit over 10 minutes just to make a cup of tea and uh, stretch my legs and make a quick phone call. Um, so cool. Thank you very much everybody for tuning in. Bear with me whilst we have a quick break and I will be right back with you in just a little over 10 minutes.
got my own monster. Nobody but me. I would never go to enemy. He's the bad guy on me. Losing my profits. Setting me free. All my dreams is stick to me. He's the bad guy on me. He's the bad guy on me. He's the bad guy on me. I got my own monster. He's the bad guy on me. Monster. He's the bad guy on me. I got my own monster. He's the bad guy on me. Got my own angel, nobody but me. I would never go to enemy. She's the good god on me, holding me back just when I need. And I don't dream she's teaching me. She's the good god on me, angel. She's the good. Both of the sides fight in me. So, angel, monster, bye bye.
Greetings! Oh, what is up and a very warm welcome back. Uh, <clears throat> the sun is still shining beautifully, actually. The weather here in England's been fantastic lately. And the magpie is presently casting. Coming to you guys right now with the uh, Midday Magpie live casting. Coming to you for two games and uh, just kind of kicking back, having some lockdown fun. Uh, let's have a look at the schedule here, just so everybody knows. Next week, I'm going to be streaming Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and uh, going to be doing some other stuff as well on the Tuesday and the Thursday, but just not actually live streaming or anything like that, or casting games. Um, probably going to be doing some things like developing a jingle, maybe getting some, some other stuff set up, just getting ready to do some other kinds of content, I guess. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's what we're going to be up to next week. We'd love to have you with us. If you can tune on in, twitch.tv slash magpie842, of course, to catch it live, where you guys are locked right now. And uh, youtube.com slash magpie842 for the VODs if you cannot join us live. Uh, I'm casting at the moment at um, 1100 hours GMT. That's midday where I am. Use Google if you want to, you know, whatever. Figure out just what time that'll be wherever you are in the world. <clears throat> now we've got a, hopefully, we've got hopefully what's going to be a pretty sweet game locked in, ready to cast next. Hey magpie, <laughs> nice, nice mullet. Who is that? Your, your screen name is so dark, I cannot actually read it on my, uh... Th oh, it's Thalas Mara! Hey there! <laughs> nice mullets. Yeah, they're coming on a bit, aren't they? The, the lockdown locks, they're really growing out. Um, one, one day, when haircuts are a thing we can do again, we're gonna get a haircut, and this will be different. But until then, yeah, we've got the magpie mullet. Sweet. Um, so anyway. Uh, it's probably about time to bring us into our next game of Company of Heroes 2 that we're going to be casting today. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and do that here. Uh, there we go. Am I using the readable colors setting on chat? It's actually a really good question, A-game. Um, you mean on the Streamlabs side of things or on the OBS side of things? Um, oh, you mean on the in the Twitch chat? Ah, um, I am using... I. I don't know if I'm using that setting necessarily, but um, I have like some weird like nighttime mods on my on this screen that I use for Twitch chat, and so that is probably interfering with the colors. Um, yeah, I might be worth looking into. It's just the one color, like the dark blue, is really hard to read. But anyway, we should introduce these players. Spawning in the south, playing as the Vermac pieces. It is going to be Mister Nobody, and spawning in the north. Playing as the Soviets, it's going to be Kanji. Uh, so, looks like both of these players going ahead and picking their commanders at an early juncture. Hit the cog near the chat button and you'll see the chat box for plugins or no plugins. Oh, okay, let's have a look at here. Look at you go. Yeah, this is really interesting stuff. I don't see an option for readable colours, though. Hmm. Wow. Well, thanks very much, A-Game. I will have a decent look at that later on when uh, I have a bit more time. But that's definitely really useful to know about. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so Mr. Nobody here has gone ahead and chosen the Encirclement Doctrine. Wow, God, it's been a minute since I've seen this guy used. Um, so we get Ambush Training, we get Stormtroopers. Break Supply Line, now that's the awesome, that's Break Supply Line and Breakthrough are very interesting and they synergize obviously with Close the Pocket. So. Break the supply line can neutralize a targeted control point with a precision strike, um, causing the territory to shift into neutral. Now, if you combine that with breakthrough, which improves the speed of all vehicles and allows them to capture points really rapidly, and it is very rapid, and that's all your vehicles, Panzer Fours, 222s, the works. Um, and then you combine that with close the pocket, which um, enemy sectors that are cut off just get bombarded. Uh, so... Oh, frontline and cutoff sectors. So occasionally we've seen players make epic plays where they cut off a load of sectors, either using breakthrough and break supply line or not, just doing it vanilla with their units, and then um, using uh, the close the pocket to just like just rinse all all their enemies' units. And it, I have seen it be catastrophic in the odd game. So fingers crossed that we get to see some pretty spectacular pyrotechnics later on. Um. Is there a story behind my name? Good question, Fidmit Franz. Yeah, there kind of is, actually. Um, <clears throat> as I take a sip on my tea. Yeah, it's... um. There is a story behind my, my name, actually. It's a little bit sort of philosophical and sort of... I don't know. I don't want to bore anyone, really, but... um. 
how, to, how, how best to explain this. Basically, I've been using the Magpie screen name for quite a long time, and it's... Uh, I find that I have quite a lot of affinity or synergy or quite a lot in common with the animal, the Magpie. Not because I'm a bird or because we have feathers or because I only dress in black and white, nothing like that. But I have, throughout the course of my entire life, actually been incredibly lucky. Like, I, I am... Objectively, there is no doubt that I've been, like, really lucky, you know? I've just had a really lucky life. And on the back of being so lucky, I have actually basically been able to spend my, the majority of my life just kind of enjoying the ride and just, I feel like I am life's sort of metaphorical magpie. I just fly over life and I get to pick the shiny bits and enjoy them as much as I can. And so I just thought that magpie was an appropriate name. Here we go. Now everyone knows. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit it's a bit of a sort of philosophical weird thing. It's a reflection of the fact that I'm just super lucky and I just get to enjoy whatever, like the best things that I think are the most shiny in life. Ta-da! Um, so looks like this has been quite a good start for Kanji. Uh, getting off to some decent field control. Mr. Nobody gonna repulse it for now. Taking back some control over mid. We've got a German marksman moving out onto the, uh, onto the field here as well. So that's... Uh, that's a statement. <laughs> but well supported. We've got an MG42, three squads of grenadiers. Looks like uh, Kanji going to be rocking up with a mortar first out of the support weapon Campania. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, Crossroad obviously is a fine map for mortar. That thing is going to be firing pretty much consistently. Um, and... Uh... Oh, thanks, Feed Mit Friends. Yeah, it is kind of beautiful. The beauty of life does not escape me. In fact, it's probably my favorite thing. <laughs> Um, so, uh, anyway, I'm getting distracted. Yeah, so this mortar tube is out. I'm going to miss the sniper dying because I'm really good at missing sniper deaths. But just in case, I've hotkeyed him to one so we can just instantly snap the camera to the sniper. Where's the sniper? Oh, he's not dying. There we go. Uh, why the 842? Well, that's an even older hangover, actually, from a much earlier time in my life. Um, and yes, the numbers are significant and there is some philosophical shit going on there as well. Uh, but I, I'm not going to explain my entire handle in one day. We've gotten the value out of the magpie part. We'll explain the 842 part another time. I'm going to remain for now a mysterious magpie, or at least a mysterious 842. But um, yeah, may, maybe next week or something, or maybe some other time when we've got a bit more time and uh, there's not a Company of Heroes 2 game happening. We'll talk about the numbers if people are interested. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for asking. Um... Oh, creative name. You're from German. Okay, cool. Guten Tag. Wie geht's? Uh, mein Deutsch ist nicht sehr gut, aber ich, ich kann ein, 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 bisschen, ein bisschen sprechen. Gesprechen? Ich kann ein bisschen sprechen. Sprache? No, wait. Ah, it's been so long. My German muscles are so weak. I love German, though. It's such an epic language. Um, a really useful language. I think... I studied German at school and it um, helped me learn Japanese quite a lot because they they actually have a lot of in, in common, which sounds strange because Japanese is a very strange language that's actually very different from German, but they have enough in common. Like, it's more it's more the philosophy or the uh, stylistic approach of the language, like the way it's mechanic, the way it's organized, rather than like anything else. I mean, obviously they don't even use the same alphabet or anything, but yeah, German really prepared me well for learning Japanese for sure. My German isn't that bad. Ah. Oh. Well, danke sehr schön. Um, yeah, my, my German's obviously much better when I'm in Germany or hanging out with Germans. Like, a lot of my gamer friends are German, and so, like, my gaming German, if I'm not thinking about it, is actually reasonable, you know? Um, I, can, I can hang out with in German, but I'm not as expressive as I'd like to be. I'm nowhere near as fluent as I'd like to be. But it's a lovely language. One thing I love about German, actually, whilst this game is just kind of going on and we're keeping an eye on this sniper, one thing I love about German is it's actually very, it's very accessible in some ways, but to people who are just learning, because a lot of the complexity in German is actually just the simple things that you've already learned, just stapled together into one word or, you know, it's, it's, it's like a lot of the sort of complexity or difficult parts of German aren't really that difficult as long as you have a decent understanding of the fundamentals. Um, so... 
And like a, for a really good example is a lot of the longer sounding, initially intimidating German words are actually just smaller German words, just literally stapled together. And they're just like, that's it. That's the word. On you go. Um, so that's just a really cool thing about German, to be honest. Sometimes you'll hear a word or you'll hear something and you'll be like, I don't actually understand that. And then your brain will just do a double take and you're like, no, I do understand that because I, I, I understand the constituent parts of it. So, yeah. Uh, the German grammar... I don't know, I kind of, I kind of enjoyed it, to be honest. Um, anyway, uh, here comes the T-70, and that is routing a lot of Germans. The pack is late relative to how this T-70 has arrived. So this T-70 is going to have the build time of this pack, plus how long it takes to move out to get into to get value. It is just the Kingmaker on the field, and un unless it gets tag burn on Lucky Faust, it's just going to be able to take shots and get value. Now, we also have guards running out onto the field. DPLMGs are finishing up promptly on them. And um, to be honest, this is looking like Soviets the way I play them. I probably would have grabbed a Maxim and not the Mortar, but this is, this is like a Super Magpie-style build. Just super middle-of-the-road, standard stuff. Get conscripts, use them to support guards, and... Um, that's kind of how I usually like to play Soviets. So yeah, seems like uh, Kanji here going to be doing a little bit of that. Nice to see the sort of uh, a style I can relate to. Wow, who's this? Engineers managed to t managed to cut off the Axis player. Oh, Mr. Nobody here getting a little bit exasperated, aggravated by all these Soviets. They are taking a good amount of field control and taking smart fights on the field. Now the pack gun is here and that unit is there. The sniper gets flustered by a load of conscripts who oorah towards him. Uh, and German forces are actually finally going to be grabbing western fuel and making some ground up here in the, in the north side of the map. So Mr. Nobody, something going right for them at least. And that's nice. That's the nice thing about Company of Heroes 2. You could be losing the battle and having a really hard time on two thirds of the map. But as long as you've got some units who are advancing unchecked elsewhere, that is fine. You can be doing badly as long as you're winning somewhere else on the map. And right now, I feel like Mr. Nobody, like, that's actually happening. Uh, you know, things are kind of going bad in terms of the actual fighting. But these units are just eating up ground. So this is actually fine for Mr. Nobody right now. Um, yeah, the best part of German is you can combine words to make new words. Yeah, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Ich bin unter Mordverdacht. It's like, hilarious. Um... So PTRS is blazing. Looks like the T-70 is going to transition over here into west. Sniper has to be careful. Rifle grenade comes down and does catch some conscripts there. T-70 continuing to find value. One pack gun is really not enough to, you know, it's never going to shut down a T-70. You need the pack gun to not die. Um, not die. But... It's never really, barring a lucky Faust, it's never really going to shut down a T-70. So this T-70 is basically still going to be just really good value, going to be policing units. Finally, it looks like Mr. Nobody's going to reconnect the cutoff, which, to be honest, it wasn't cutting off that much, but now at least getting the benefit of a munitions point, which is pretty big for Vermac, to be honest. Um, this mortar is very far forward. Look how aggressively positioned this mortar is. Uh... And it's actually okay. I mean, it's it, it has range to the cutoff here, and it's at the moment it's fine. It's being supported by the T70. It has some engineers nearby, uh, so that's actually really nice. Anytime you go for guards, you're always going to have a slightly smaller Soviet army, and we are sort of seeing that. Like we would be used to seeing maybe another conscript squad and a Maxim, or you know, some other stuff in this list. But guards are 360 manpower. Yeah, so they are they are quite the pricey squad, um, and they cost they cost relatively like a high amount to reinforce as well. So. They are quite manpower intensive. Where are all the Axis munitions going? Well, we've got an LMG-42. Um, there might be telemines. There should be telemines. I feel like there must be telemines to help deal with this T-7. Yeah, we're seeing telemines coming down. Um, uh, I feel like there's definitely more telemines on the map that I just haven't spotted yet. Let's put it that way. I'm, fr I'm frantically panning around, but... Can't see any telemines just now. There are also some uh, TM-35 uh, mines popping up in the Axis side of the map as well. So both players making good use of mines as we expect it to see at this level of play. Soviet forces going to be kicking ass and taking names here in the south and the east of the map. But the Axis still having the run of the west, so the fuel point and the victory point. As I say oftentimes on the channel, as long as you can control a fuel point and a victory point, you are more or less keeping your hopes intact for the game. Um... 
you will, as long as you control a fuel point and a munitions point, you will have a chance at redemption, even if the opening stages of the game have looked kind of bad and you've had a hard time. So, you know, it might not be a good chance, but you will get your shot somewhere, hopefully. Um, so, yeah. The cutoff getting cut off again. How good has Kanji been at about exploiting this point? I mean, the, it's almost a shame that it's not cutting off very much, but this is great work to keep controlling this point. And, I mean, we've seen Axis units... Whoa! Ostwind! Bah, 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 bah. Ostwind! That's pretty cool. Also throwing a lot of grenades. That's Yeah, that's a really good point. Creative name there. Um, there have been a lot of uh, rifle grenades popped. Um, or at least one that I can think of, but I'm sure there are others too. Is this gun present and correct? Going to be making this composition look just like a super respectable Soviet force. I'm loving what I see here. The Ostwind is going to be kind of issues, but I feel like between the guards and the Zis gun, we can start controlling it and then make adjustments moving forward. Sniper here, just going to GTFO in the nick of time as the T-70 starts casting shells his way. Um, <clears throat> and the Soviet forces are going to be just consolidating uh, Kanji's position here in the southeast of the map. Here comes the Ostwind. With some uh, oh, some very appropriate sort of camouflage there that looks very historically accurate and appropriate for the map. I like it. That is a KV two. Sorry, KV one. Of course, yeah. Okay, we're gonna have a KV one game. I didn't see this coming. Uh. Okay, chat. What do you think about this KV one? Is this good? Uh. I don't know. I know that KV-1s are a lot better than they used to be. They're faster, and to be honest, the KV-1 is going to match up against the Oswin really well. So that's good for the um, Soviet player. But did we need to build a KV-1 here, or could we have held on for something a bit pokier in a little bit? I don't know. I, my kind of my gut feeling is that this KV-1 is probably fine. It does support infantry really well. The KV-1 has quite a big silhouette, so you can actually put infantry behind it fairly nicely. Um, creative name in chat. Just want to brag, but he made this commander meta. Well, are you talking about the guard rifle combined arms tactic? Cool, cool, and I hope that we get to see a uh, uh, a uh, ML20 in this game as well. Oh, Grenadier is probably going to get rinsed. Arr, the T70 takes no prisoners, going to destroy that squad there. An, an ill opportune moment there for the Axis player, but uh, definitely a sustainable loss. Hasn't broken the back of the Axis composition at all. The sniper as well sneaking away on a pixel, so he's kind of okay as well. The medic's going to see to him. Uh, the KV-1 is actually going to come out into west here to just police these Axis units that have been so consistently finding value for Mr. Nobody creeping up the west flank. Those Panzer Grenadiers will not be able to handle the Soviet heavy here. And look how much more manoeuvrable it is compared to what we were used to seeing. Like, I, I think it was it. Was it buffed in the most recent patch or the one before? I can't remember. But anyway, this thing now turns pretty sprightly and its acceleration is like kind of semi-reasonable. Uh, so yeah, it's just a good unit of force. It's not a very sophisticated unit and it does lose to any kind of technicality or sophistication in the AT resources of your opponent's army, but it's uh, definitely acceptable for now. And um, let's have a look at the veterancy abilities. So Vet 1 is going to be secure mode, which is still probably the worst Vet 1 vehicle ability in the game. Um, hang on though, as we've got a fight coming down here. Looks like the Ostwind going to be Finding good damage here. Now, here come the guards. Now, oh wow, if he's able to button this Ostwind, now nah, he won't know. Uh, the KV-1 going to check the Ostwind. There is a pack gun back here, but the KV-1 has actually got a decent HP pool, so can take a little bit of abuse at the hands of a pack gun and not worry too much. Can sort of shrug off a few hits. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we are on double engineer for the Soviet player, which is just a really crucial adaptation that I sometimes see Soviet players miss, but there comes a point, usually after you've got anything beyond the T-70, that you really want to engineer squads, and it's very important to step up to that. Uh, we've got one with flamethrower, one with metal detector, of course, which makes a lot of sense. Um, the KV-1 is a budged IS-2 in a better commander. Interesting take. Interesting take. Because, yeah, I agree. I don't actually especially like either of the IS-2 commanders myself. I appreciate that they're both fine. Um, you get the KV-8 one, which has a lot of, like, shocking stuff like the incendiary artillery and shocks. And you get the um, armored assault guy who has the IL IS-2, uh, sorry, the IL-2 attack to go with it. Both both fine commanders, but not really... I just don't really like them. And to, in, in my heart of hearts, I actually... The IS-2 is a fine unit, but I don't really often feel like I have a place for it in the game when I'm playing as Soviets. Like, it's, it's clearly fine, and if you can call it in, it's great, but I don't like it. I don't think it's especially great. 
The guards get gunned down. We just come down here in the nick of time to see the last guard go down to the STGs of those Panzer Grenadiers. A bit of loss there for Kanji. That's tough. We've got a weird stalemate sort of here. But the Axis player is starting to trail in terms of the VPs. Soviets have finally taken charge of West, although the sniper might have something to say about that. Um, and this, this Ostwind has been so-so. Not really finding the damage that I expect Mr. Nobody wanted with it, but it's still alive and kicking, so we'll see how it, uh, how it fares as the game moves on. This KV-1 as well also, not really finding a lot of damage. Actually, for a game on Crossroad, where both players have got pretty decent rosters, this has been a very low-intensity game, hasn't it? Look at this, we've just had like quite a lot of quiet over the last few minutes. Triple Cap gets established, though, by the Soviet player, and I imagine that that will force Mr. Nobody's hand here, as they will have to engage in. Sniper is getting some nice veterancy. Yeah, up to two stars now. That's when it gets a rate of fire increase. Uh, so that is a strict DPS. Oh! Caster's curse. Uh, at least we caught him on camera this time. Sniper gets gunned down by uh, an Ura and some sharp shooting from some three-star conscripts. He might be a sniper, but those conscripts with Moist and Nagant, like killed him very quickly. Uh, I don't know why the Panzer Grenadiers are on hold fire, honestly. And it's going to be a Katusha. Oh, I like this. So the Katusha actually synergizes quite nicely with the KV-1 and the T-70. And if you're going to... How much is a KV-1 then? So a KV-1 is 145 fuel, so a little bit more expensive than a T-34-85. Wow, that is a slightly unfavorable comparison for the KV-1, I feel. Uh... But it's definitely affordable, and it's a great thing for a Katusha to hide behind. So I really like, I really like going for the Katusha because that, it's one of my favourite things in RTS or indeed any game. Is just make the game the other guy's problem, make the game so that if 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 nothing happens, you're going to win. And the Katusha sort of does that. It's like okay, so I've kind of got field control, and I'm going to keep hurling Katusha barrages at you, and you have to take an like you have to engage unfavorably into me. I will have the defender's advantage. Like this is a dynamic. I, hey, we've got a Panzerwerfer. That's a dynamic I like. So we're going to have Panzerwerfer versus Katusha here. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Um, yeah. Okay, here we go. Waiting for that first Katusha barrage. Could come down at any second now. Reasonable fight being attempted by Mr. Nobody's here, but the Ostwind is getting abused at the hands of a Ziskun and a KV-1. It will fall back safely, just for now. It has Blitz, finally. So that, that Ostwind ought to be a little bit harder to pick off with the Blitz. How much does the Stuka... Okay, so it costs 80 to do the Stuka break supply line, and it costs 50 fuel. Ah, wow, I forget that that's a fuel ability. That's actually super useful, because Vermact, in the, in the late, late game, you're almost always stacking loads of spare fuel. So um, that's a great ability to be able to burn off fuel for in-game value. That's actually super useful. Very interesting indeed. Uh, Katusha might kill the Ostwind, you think? Oh, here it comes. Oh, so he finds one of the pack guns. But that is a very long-range barrage. Ooh, the Panzerwerfer might just want to back up a bit. He's probably okay. Oh, he's going to fire the Werfer. <gasps> That's a great shot. Oh, nice. Finds one squad, almost two, of engineers who I believe were setting up mines or attempting to. So that's really nice. Find some great value on the first barrage on that Panzerwerfer. It's what we like to see. Um, that Katusha barrage was quite long range and it was very, it was sort of speculative. Speculative? I always get that word wrong. Oh, yeah, might kill the Ost. Yeah, sorry. Might, it might kill the Ost here player. Right, yeah, sure. I was like, how's the Katusha going to kill this Ostwind? Okay, cool. <laughs> um. Yeah, that does make sense. I mean, if this Katusha is able to survive and just keep a stacking value into this game, then yeah. I mean, it's a unit that can kill Vermac players. It's one of my favorite things about playing Soviets, because Vermac units are so fragile, and Vermac rely more heavily than OKW on weapon teams. Like, if, you're, if your Vermac player has no weapon teams, you're probably winning that game. Like, they need, they need weapon teams, at least in this stage of the game. And the Katusha just punishes all of those things about your opponent. Like, so if your opponent has small squads, and if they're relying on weapon teams, then the Katusha is good. So, yeah, definitely could find a lot of value here. This Ostwind uh, has been a bit meh, hasn't it? He's trying to get value out of it. It looks like he has completed the tech tree, though. So, uh, 
The Schwer Panzer HQ, the Heavy Panzer Corps, is completed for the Vermac player here. Conscript's trying to harass the cutoff. Meanwhile, Axis Force is pushing into mid, but there's just a Maxim in this building, and it's not going to happen. The KV-1 is here on Overwatch. The, uh, the Zis gun is keeping the Ostwind back. And now the KV-1 actually coming in. There is a pack gun here, so you probably don't want to engage too hard. Katusha Barrage is going to be used to try and blunt the momentum of this push. Panzer Grenadiers and Stormtroopers getting hit by this. But they are actually going to overrun. The Ostwin finds the Katusha, so that'll be a kill. Nice. And moves on to the T-70 next. KV-1 going to come across, but that Ostwin has Blitz, so it'll escape. The Zis gun uh, re re retracts, but a bundle grenade coming down. Might pick up the Maxim squad here. Keep an eye on that Maxim squad. Could get... Yeah, yeah he wipes the Maxim squad. Okay. Mr. Nobody finally taking a really nice fight here. Zis gun barrage going to come down as a kind of spiteful... Ah, uh, kind of like trying to get some damage as Mr. Nobody goes out the door there. But that was a lovely fight. That was really smartly orchestrated and well arranged by Mr. Nobody. Just really intelligently done. Gets the Katusha, puts a lot of damage on the KV-1 and the T-70. Uh, picks off the Maxim. So that was just very good damage being found there. Katusha's going to get rebought. Okay, cool. And I think this time perhaps just leave the Katusha here. I don't know. Certainly when it's not firing. Crossroads is a great map for Katushas because it's small and the Katusha can pretty much hit anywhere and it's very easy to drive it up close to get those accurate barrages. But it's also, because it's so small, you have to be very careful with where you leave the Katusha. So um, getting caught out a little bit there was uh, Kanji. Fortunately, Kanji is quite rich in terms of fuel, so can replace the Katusha and even look to get another sort of... Brumba! Yes! Urgh, we're seeing a Brumbar! Okay! Oh, I've wanted to cast a Brumbar for so long, but nobody builds them. And I'm sure they're really good now, because they've had so many changes. I honestly think that Vermac players are underestimating the utility of the, of the Brumbar, because it can fire over line of sight blockers. It can just sit back and make the game the allied player's problem. It just consistently finds value. It's hard to kill. It just does all the things that Vermac want done in the late game. So I am really excited that we are seeing a, a Brumbar in this game. Um, that's excellent. I'm, I'm hyped. So let's have a look at the veteran's abilities. Bunker Busting Barrage at Vet 1. Um, ve vet 2, the Armoured Skirts, of course, and a Rate of Fire. So that's a very important star of veterancy, that second one. And at Vet 3, we get improved mobility and rate of fire again. So all of the veterancy, fantastic and just what you want on your Brumbar. Katusha Barrage coming down here, gets a pack gun crew. May get the hardware if a rocket falls right onto it. But we're going to go and watch the opening shell of this Brumbar as it takes half the health off of a conscript squad. I mean, look at this thing. Now he's going to try and do something about this Zis gun. Biff. And now the Ostwin comes in with a Panzerwerfer barrage, so he gets the uh, Zis gun. And without the Zis gun, there, I mean, there really isn't a credible threat to the Brumbar. Like, the KV-1 can tickle it, but it's about it. IL-2 attack is going to come down to try and just hold the tide here, but the Ostwin will limit the efficiency of that call-in. And this is uh, turning into a great game. Creative name says would prefer a Panther. Yeah, I, I, I actually accept that argument, because your opponent has this KV-1, which, you don't, which you're having a hard time killing. But on the flip side, the KV-1 is also not really doing you very much damage, so I would say it's quite a low priority threat. It is a threat, though. Um, and the adaptation here from the Soviet player is going to be an SU-85, which you all know I love the unit, but of course it makes a lot of sense too. You've got three fantastic targets for the, uh, um, I, uh, for the um, SU-85 to start vetting up on here. And... Uh, Crossroads is a small map with quite open lines of sight in the middle where the SU-85 is relatively easy to micro um, and it's just going to be consistently because of its range taking shots throughout the game so yeah this is a long way of saying I think the SU-85 is sweet here like really sweet I think if he can afford some guards next then I think guards would make this roster look a lot more respectable um, he's actually got the money for guards and DPs now and I think I quite like that. Perhaps a bit risky when your opponent has Oswin Brumbar actually. Maybe actually. I'm, th I'm rethinking that now. I forgot that. Um, 500 XP per plane for the Oswin. Is it? Wow. Alright, the KV-1 here is getting hooned on, but the SU-85 is going to announce its presence here and the Oswin has to skedaddle back. The Katusha Barrage is going to punish these pack guns if they opt to stay and fight, but that KV-1 is on death's door. Uh-oh, we're creeping in with the SU-85. That's so risky! Uh, we can't really be doing that. And now the Brumbar, which hasn't actually been fully repaired, is uh, in the line of fire here. That SU-85 looking to score some veterancy. And look, we saw two penetrating hits there. Half a star of veterancy. 
tank destroyers, but especially the SU-85, they rank up so fast. And the veterancy is so good. So, um, yeah, definitely very scary. Going to be use the, using the SU-85 to get the kill on the pack gun hardware as well. Um, and uh, the Panzerwerfer barrage comes down here, but it looks like uh, Kanji heard that one coming and was able to scatter his infantry nicely. Panzer Grenadiers uh, taking a bit of damage there. So the hold fire was on them. There was a question earlier about why hold fire was on them. It's because they have the camo upgrade has come down on them. So they're going to be used as a sneaky cloaked camo unit to cap to cap points around the map. And we've seen on crossroads that can be a really useful what. Ah! How is this game over? Uh, huh? Help me understand what happened here, guys. I feel like Mr. Nobody has left the game. Although it's not actually immediately clear. Oh no! Ah, oh, that was developing into such an interesting late game. What a shame. Gosh. That's just a real shame. Um... I, I feel like Mr. Nobody has left the game because they've lost all their core infantry. That could have been a really cool match. Um... Ah. Oh. Uh, I mean, he has lost basically all of his core infantry. But we had Brumbar, Panzerwerfer, Ostwind. What a sick composition. Versus KV-1, SU-85, Katusha. What? That was just a great game, which had a sniper in the early game and everything. Oh, wow. I feel like we've been a little bit unlucky there. Um, but I, th I think that... I think that Mr. Nobody felt like they were so far behind on the scoreline and they were getting ground down by Soviet value. And there was no real answer in this list for the SU-85. Let's be honest. Nothing in this nothing in this army can beat the SU-85. And when you look at the top left here, the SU-85 covers everything in the bottom row, counters all those units, makes them very difficult to use. And the uh, Katusha kind of makes it very difficult to use most of these things in the top row. Um, Especially with Soviets just having, you know, seven-man conscripts out there, able to push onto all the points. So, uh, I mean, good game. I feel like that one ended a bit soon, though. I was just getting into that one. A Brumbar game, of all things. And it, I think it's clear to me from that game that um, if you're going for a Brumbar build, I think you need... I, I'm not sure that you can have an Ostwind or... You need something else, like at least a Stug or something, because the trouble is, at, at least against Soviets, if you go for a Brumbar and you have no hard anti-tank thing that can deal with an SU-85, then the SU-85 just is so punishing, isn't it? Like, I think pretty much the SU-85 single-handedly... Think about how much value that it made almost unusable. I mean, that was so much fuel that it made almost unusable for the, for the Axis player, so... SU-85s are good. <laughs> What can we say except that? All right, so we're gonna we're gonna cast one more game today because uh, that one was cut short. So let's see what we got here. We got TR's opportunity cost and uh, a Kanji player here on Angerville. I uh, haven't cast an Angerville game for a little bit. We've got El Dorado and what the f uh, that would be a Wehrmacht and Soviet on Crossroad Winter, and we've got uh, the Angry Dutchman and Insane Ivy on Langriskaya. So chat, let me know if you've got any uh, strong thoughts one way or the other as to which of those three games. Well, it's once again, we've got Opportunity Cost and Kanji. We've got Eldorado and WTF. And we've got Angry Dutchman and Insane Ivy. Those are the matches there that we could cast. So uh, definitely let me know if anyone out there, if you have any preferences. And uh, uh, we'll go ahead and jump into one of those. Uh, uh, Siglis wants to see Opportunity Cost. Yeah, I mean, that's the Angerville game, which I'm kind of excited to see as well, because that's just, it'd be a nice change of pace to get that map on. Angerville, yeah. All right, that's two votes for Angerville. Looking pretty good. Seems good to me. Okay. All right. Ah, I think it's clear. It's Angerville time. 
It's Angerville. It's Angerville time. Unable to... Oh, what? We've missed it. We've literally missed it. Let's update the lobby. Can't cast that one, people. Sorry. Um... But we do have the prospect of Kanji versus Animal Killer on Nexus, which I appreciate doesn't start for seven minutes, but that one looks great. Um, so I think we're going to just do that. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not even going to make this one democratic. We're going to do that one because it's OKW versus Soviets, which we've not had today, and I would love that. Okay, so we're going to load this one in, and then I'll see just how long's on the clock, because uh, we are quite hot on this one. Who the hell is Animal Killer? I don't know who Animal Killer is, but they are at the top of the lobby, and I've cast a few games from them, and they are cool. Like, they're definitely a good player. But seeing as how players can change their names all the time, so I don't really keep up with them, so I don't actually know who Animal Killer is, I'm afraid. Fitting to undemocratically pick a Soviet game. That didn't even occur to me, but yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Supreme Leader Magpie here has decided it is for the greater good of you all that we cast this game featuring Soviets. Okay, so it looks like we've got 5 minutes 55 till this game uh, actually gets back underway. Um, so I think I'm just going to give my voice a bit of a rest um, just for 5 minutes and make myself yet another cup of tea. Um, because I'm still British and I still need tea and uh, I'll see you guys back here uh, in five minutes just in time for this game to begin. Um, I'll tell you what, what we can do is we can pop the win amp up and we can get, whoop, that is not factually accurate. There we go. That is factually accurate. Sweet. Let's find some sick beats to play while I'm gone. Is this a good track? Hold up. Yep, this one here. Yeah, this one looks pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the game ended really abruptly, creative name. You missed it, I'm afraid. Anyway, I'll be back in time for this game to begin. See you all very shortly.
Greetings! Oh, what is up and a very warm welcome back to the channel. The, the sun is still shining and the magpie is still casting. I come at you guys right now with a live one versus one battle here on Nexus featuring Spawning in the West, the Overcommand West pieces of Animal Killer, who has featured on the channel in the past and is quite the capable player, Spawning in the East. Coming off the back of a pretty cool win, which was cut a little abruptly short, it is going to be Kanji playing once again as the Soviet pieces. And uh, let's have a look here. What did I miss in chat? Uh, we as one who left the game. What kind of ah? What kind of tea am I drinking? Well, I'm glad you asked, Sigley. Uh, that is um some jasmine tea. It is um it's a jasmine pearl blend. If you're super into your green teas, um it is fresh from China and it is damn tasty. Um, I am quite into green tea, so I really only have the finest, and I've got a selection of green teas, all brilliant stuff. So yeah. And look at this, check this out. I don't know if hang on, wait. I don't know if you guys can see on the tiny camera here, but you see that? That is a that is a double walled tea glass, which keeps your tea really hot and your hands really cold. And it's once you've tried them, you just can't go back. And I'm sounding like an idiot, but seriously, this is the coolest stuff. It just keeps your tea hot forever, because it's like obviously it's vacuum insulated. So yep. That's uh that's pretty cool. Um let's see, creative name. I'm still you're still owed an explanation of the cards on the wall. Um, okay, so those cards are Animal Crossing amiibo cards, um, which you can use to like interact with the game in various ways. I just thought they'd be fun to collect for just a couple of, because I was really bored at the start of lockdown. Um, but also they're my favorite characters, so now I've got them in the game, which is like really sick. I know, Animal Crossing, whatever, say what you like, it's actually a really good game. I mean, if, if you like, if you don't like it, that's fine, but they are so well made, those games, they are amazing, like they're just... They're just very good and honestly have been really helpful for me in lockdown. <laughs> um, remember, of course, I do, I live by myself. So because of the lockdown, this has been like nearly two months now where I just haven't seen other people, which is like tough. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, not, not for more than like a, an hour or a day here or there. And I certainly, you know, I'm doing the social distancing thing. So it's not like I can just go to the park or go to the pub or, you know, any of the things that I might normally do or see my friends or hang out in the conventional sense. So Animal Crossing has been really good for picking up that slack. Um, but uh, nice Kubel Wagon uh, kill here. Yeah, it was double Kubel opening. Good spot there at chat. Thank you. Uh, this uh, this uh, special rifle command clown car opening though is going to shred double Kubel. You don't really want to do Kubels into clown cars, and this is why. Uh, so Animal Killer making a bit of a gamble here, and it's not paying off. No, oh, I didn't see the Kettenwerfer was in position though. I thought that was in the north. Okay, well he gets the clown car, which is not the most expensive unit, but for two Kubel wagons, this still favors the Soviet player, I think. And oh god, well that's a demolition charge. Bye. <laughs> ah, I love it. Building Soviet economy, making Russia strong. Nice. This is how we do it. Blow stuff up. Um, but um, through the rest of my house, I have, um, I do have cards on the wall, and they are really much nicer than those cards, because the cards in the rest of my house are foil Magic: The Gathering cards which are on my walls for various reasons. Some are valuable, some are really sentimental to me, some just look really cool. We've got some really cool magic cards about the place, so I'm just just, just putting out a brag about my humble magic cards that I've got. They're sweet. Um, that is the hell of, that is a hell of an infantry roster. Storm Pioneer, AT gun. Yeah, it's, it's actually gotten worse. It's now, well, <laughs> the, he's got two Storm Pioneer now and now he can recrew the, uh, oh God, he has to recrew the Kettenwerther with Storm Pioneers. That stings. Um, so, okay. This is a rough opener for Animal Killer here, but it's not insurmountable. I think if you open double Kuba Wagon and you have to be okay, a part of you has to be know that this can go spectacularly wrongly and you can get heavily punished and then you lose your Kuba Wagons and things look dire and you have to have a contingency plan. So Animal Killer is switching to plan B. He knows he's behind in this game, but that's okay. Um, it's the early stages of the game. Manpower income is still high. You can bounce back from this. It's going to be a tough couple of minutes, you know, but... This game is still actually fine. You can you can risk double Kuba Wagon, and you, you did get some value. You got the clown car, so this is still fine. Three Storm Pioneers, what the hell? Okay, yeah, what the hell? I'm confused as well. This just seems like you lose to a Maxim, but I suppose he knows his opponent didn't go for a support armor company, a Campanaya, so... 
a support weapon camp on IR. Um, so there isn't actually going to be a Maxim anytime soon. And it looks to me like the way the way the way Kanji has chosen guard motor coordination tactics, it sort of looks like they might actually not be planning to build the support weapon camp on IR for a little bit, because we've got guards coming out, and we've got um, the mortar tube can be purchased. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I always say it, and I think it still holds true here. I, anytime Soviet players try to play too long without support weapon camp and I, I get really worried for them. And I think this is one of those games like you cannot go support we without support weapon camp and I for too long. You're gonna need Maxims. You're gonna need Zis guns. This is Nexus. Like so. Uh, yeah, Triple Storm Pioneer is weird AF. I don't know what the plan is here. Is that not even correct Russian? Okay, my I, I Russian is a language that I've always admired because it sounds beautiful and I love the character set. Um, however, I've never learned any. Uh, I know how to say like two things, I think. Minyama uh, Zavut Magpie, which is my name is Magpie. And um, I know if you see a good friend or anything, it's like a cool greeting to go like, Shtarova, which is like a thing. And I know like a few other bits and bobs here, like um, I think, is it like Brad Naroda is like enemy of the people? So that's always good to know, right? Gotta know that in Soviet, I mean Russian. Um, so there we go. Um, yeah, three storms loses to basically everything. Yeah, you're not wrong. Like even conscript concaves can be difficult for storm pioneers to deal with. Um, so yeah, is Kampanaya not a Russian w word? Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I, I take your word for it. So, this is weirdest stuff here. He's gone for Battle Grip at HQ behind this. But Animal Killer is having a rough time in this game. Uh, not trailing by as much as they could be. The Russian words that Relic used are really weird. Okay. How is your Russian, A game? Do you know, do you know Russian at all? That's a... You seem to have some knowledge in this area. Urgh. Penal Battalion hitting some mines there. Oh god, actually they could be wiped? Nah, they're okay. Looks like uh, looks like Kanji hot on the micro there. It doesn't leave them hanging out to die. You you are Russian. Oh yeah, of course. I mean I mean I know you live in Lithuania. I didn't realize you are literally Russian though. Huh. Cool. Well, that explains it then. So I assume your Russian is quite good. Oh, that's fascinating. Awesome. So it's going to be a T-70 build here. Uh, Kanji has the Tankaby Battalion Command. That's going to be coming out here. Yeah, I think for me, one of the things that sort of slightly is, a, is slightly irksome for me. Uh, most expensive core infantry ever, yes. And now we're mixing in Fauschermjägers as a not, as a, the only, basically one of the only more expensive infantry options. We've actually got Fauschermjäger coming in. Um, Okay, wow, so a native Russian speaker. Jeez, that's fascinating. I don't know why I never put that together, the fact you live in Lithuania and the fact that you might speak Russian just never occurred to me. Um, but um, uh, what was I about to say? Uh, it's gone. <laughs> Let's not worry about it. Oh yeah, no, that's what I was going to say. One thing that I've always found slightly irksome about Company of Heroes 2, whilst I love the voice files, and they do have a lot of character and, frankly, comedy appeal, like the German voice files, the British voice files, the American voice files, and the Russian voice files, it does sort of annoy me in a way, though, that there is no, like, native language mode. Like, you, you can't just tick a box and have the Russian voice files for the Soviet forces and just have them all speaking as they actually would Russian. Or you cannot actually have the German forces speaking in German. And that kind of really bugs me because I love being exposed to foreign languages in that way. And I, if I could have the German dude speaking German, I would learn. I would learn German from this game. Like just little phrases, some words here and there, and it'd be really useful for me. Um, and to be honest, it does make it a bit corny, like a little bit sort of not cr kind of crass in a way that like it's German accents, but they're speaking English, and it's like Russian accents, but they're speaking English. Like it just seems a little bit weird. Artillery guy, 155 millimeters. Uh, I don't think you can. I remember checking years ago, although I haven't checked for a while, so maybe you can now. Probably worth looking, but I don't believe you can. I could be wrong. Um, there, there's, there's almost certainly a way of modding the game so that you can, yeah. Um, 
You can change the game language, yeah, but then all of the voices will be German, so, like, the Russians will still be speaking German. Um, you know? So, I mean, changing the game language doesn't actually achieve the result that I want. Um, whereas if you play, like, Ruse or Steel Division, like, a lot of the units in that game and those games actually just speak the language that you're speaking. So you'll click on a German unit and they'll be like, Achtung! And, they, you know, they'll, they'll actually be speaking German. And same for the Soviets and so forth. So anyway, this game is just like, what? how is Animal Killer... Is, okay, so we, we, we are kind of stabilizing. I think losing the Kuba Wagons in the early game was not game-ending damage. It was a bad start, but you take a gamble on a start like that and you don't lose too much and it's okay. But then going for this crazy composition, that I think has put Animal Killer behind for a little bit longer than, I, than they might have been otherwise. But having said that, I mean, this is actually doing okay. He's starting to hold the map a bit. Holding one of the VPs is crucial. Nice demolition charge here. Not quite getting a squad wipe. Uh, and we're going for a second T70, which is also weird. But yeah, this composition is out there, man. Falshroom Jaeger and uh, Storm Pioneers. I mean, if I'm if I'm Kanji here, I am definitely throwing down a support weapon campanile and punishing your opponent's elite infantry with machine guns and mortars. Like, that is the counter, right? So, but uh, Animal Killer is out here taking the midline of the map, grabbing fuel. Okay, th those guys get repulsed, but like... Doing some work with this composition. Uh, the scoreline, he's off the clock. We've got mechanized armor, oh, sorry, um, mechanized regiment headquarters here. So, you know, the tech tree is developing. Uh, it's gonna be a Puma, and that is gonna, like, dominate the two T-70s. So, signs of life here for Animal Killer with the weird build. Um. <clears throat> uh... Yeah, creative name. That is what I'm saying. Yeah, so some games just have the correct native voice files for every unit, like, um, and it's just a much more natural experience because, like, it's just weird to me that you click on a German unit and they're speaking to you in English with a German accent. It's like, it's just weird. <laughs> it feels like I'm watching a film that's been dubbed. That's what it feels like, and I hate dubs. <laughs> I just cannot deal with dubs. Oh, there's Storm Pine is sneaking away. Man. Okay, now here comes the um, here comes the Puma. Going to be uh, taking some nice shots into the T-70s. And has to be a bit careful, but should be winning this one handily. I love the no micro, I've got this sort of approach. The T-70s, like, struggling to find value. They get a bit of, dam bit of damage on the Puma, but yeah, this is one that the Puma's going to take. But I mean, here come the Penals. Careful now. We don't quite have the munitions. Uh, no, what does this need? Oh, you need the PTRS rifle upgrade before you can throw the anti-vehicle demo charge. Did not know that. Uh, or at least had forgotten that. And now, I mean, the noose is retightened. Look at the map. Triple cap for the Soviet player. And everything's looking super rough. Yeah, like one of the things that Yes, I mean, for example, when you click on a, on a German sniper and he's like, and, and you tell him to move when he's being shot and he's like, getting my arse out of here. It's like, literally nobody in the world talks like that. And it's like, it's kind of cute and funny the first few times, but after a while you're just like, I could take this game a lot more seriously if he was just speaking German. <laughs> okay, T70 getting some nice shots. The PTRS is doing good damage onto this... Uh, onto this Puma, which is forced back. And what do you do? Like, how do you hold off infantry? If the Falschermjägers aren't here, and they're not, these these guards just beat everything. They beat all of this stuff. So that's kind of tough. Um, finally, the Falschermjägers show up, and they can get these guards to go away. But this is... I, mm, I mean, I, I like experimenting with stuff, and I love trying to understand people's left-field takes on stuff, but this Axis composition is difficult. And to be honest, I feel like he's only having an okay game because Kanji has not built a support weapon camp and I, I think as soon as your opponent has Maxims and a Mortar, like, you just lose, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure. So... Yeah, I don't... I don't think this is good. But it is kind of fun to watch, and he's not dead yet, so like... <laughs> Let's see what happens. Puma here doing a great job against these T-70s. That is the one thing that's going well for Animal Killer, is the vehicle dynamic. The Puma versus two T-70s, like that Puma is fine. 
he'll just be taking shots all day. And to be honest, getting the second star of veterancy, heading on to the third now, ugh, PCRS is coming in, but heading on to that third star of veterancy, and if the Puma gets to three stars, that is actually reasonable against Soviet medium armor at that point. So, you know, if, if Kanji is banking on going for T-34s, or to some extent even an SU-85, the Puma is actually quite good against the SU-85 because it's so fast. So even if the SU-85 gets a hit, the Puma will usually be able to get up on top of the SU-85. And obviously, once the Puma is onto the sides and rear of the SU-85, without support, that is a dead SU-85. Um, so... <laughs> there are silver linings here. This is triple Fauschermiger. Bro, Kanji, can we build the support weapon camp and I are now? You need Maxim guns. And a mortar would be nice. A mortar is not essential, though, but you do need Maxim guns. Like, you're trying to take on triple Fauschermjäger, triple Storm Pioneer, with no machine guns. I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. He has had a Raketenwerfer for this whole game and is still getting bullied by light vehicles. But I don't know, to be honest. I mean, the T-70s are finding some value, but that Puma is getting quite fed. Uh, and that's, that, that is a real problem. Like, Pumas scale so well. He can be quite aggressive with this Puma. So two stars is when it gets the accuracy and rate of fire, and it's three stars for penetration. All right, he can probably get this T-70 if there are no mines. No, he's going to let it go. Oh, no, he gets it. Yeah, there we go. Pumas have just got good range. And, like, the rate of fire on this Puma is quite intense. The Raketenwerfer chips in. Oh, the PTRSs are here, though. He gets both of the T-70s, and he gets out with the Puma. Yeah, oh, you have to keep backing up, man, the PTRSs. Oof. Okay, he gets away with it. Oh, my God. Kanji is going for a T-3485. Do not like. I think that's a really bad idea, unless he gets the Puma here. <gasps> Run away. Why are we not microing this away? Oh, no. You cannot lose the Puma here, Animal Killer. Okay, he gets the Puma out. Jesus. Because if your opponent's going for a T-3485 and you have a three-star Puma, I actually like that for the Axis player. Like, as someone who can micro a Puma, although I say so myself, uh -huh, like, I will take that fight every day. Give me the three-star Puma and I will give you a dead T-3485. Like, I can do that. That's fine. It's 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 actually quite easy. Like, if the three-star Puma... I mean, yeah. And that, that the T-3485 is also concerning because you're actually feeding even more veterancy than a regular medium tank because of the like increased value density of the of the 85. So I don't know about this, if I'm honest. This is sketchy. Oh yeah, he actually has no Fausts. That's a really good point. Yeah, because Faust and Mjöger had their Fausts taken off a long time ago. Because they were way too good with Fausts, let's be honest. Um, so, okay, T-3485 is here, but this just seems like the perfect meal for this Puma. Why is he not repairing the Puma? Okay, he is being repaired. There we go. Uh, yeah, I mean, if this is such a weird game, man. I swear, if Animal Killer win wins this game, everyone's going to lose their minds. This does not look like a game that the, Soviet, that the Axis player should have won. But, like, no machine guns and going for this weird T-3485 is actually playing into Animal Killer's hands. Like... With the cooperation of Kanji, Animal Killer is... This is a recoverable game now. Weird to say. And Animal Killer is actually floating some fuel. I know we don't have Schwer Panzer HQ, but like... Maybe a Panzer II? Don't know. I feel like a Panzer II could be an option here. Uh, oh, look, we've had a follow. So I, I apologize again for the fact that my... Um, Alert notifications aren't working just for follows. It's so frustrating. Everything else is working, but not those. And I don't know why. And I've tried everything, and it's really annoying. But thank you very much for the follow, uh, ED ED eighty hertz. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. It means a lot. That's awesome. Welcome to week one, Magpie eight forty two streaming on Twitch. You're getting in, getting in on the ground floor of the Magpie phenomenon, <laughs> whatever that is. <laughs> anyway. Puma here looking to get that third star of veterancy, and it is close now. Just looking for any damage it can get onto the uh, Soviet medium. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that that's not what ED stands Oh, well, well yeah, I guess maybe. <laughs> it's probably not what he had in mind when he chose the name, though. And, uh, I mean, Storm Pioneers do do good damage at these ranges. And, you know, once the Storm Pioneers get their second star of veterancy, that is where they do the have the, the, a very significant DPS bump. 
Uh, and these Storm Pioneers do have that. We've definitely lost a squad of Storm Pioneers off camera somewhere, for which I do apologise. Uh, God damn, this is a weird composition. Look how much manpower he's floating. Please build a support armor core and get some Maxim guns. I swear you'll just win. Well, you won't just win, but you'll have a much easier time, bro. Like, I really think so. I think that has to be the way. Um. Yay! He's building it. Hooray! Cool. Well, better late than never, you know. Late Maxim is still Maxim. So that's pretty good. Sorry, A-game, I do a terrible Russian accent, but I still have fun with it. So... A moment of quiet here as these two players kind of get to grips with each other. This is the weirdest game. Such a weird game. Is this gun going to be coming out first? I guess we're making preparations for the Axis player's fuel unit of choice. I guess that makes sense. I just I just thought that we'd go for some Maxims to help out in the meantime. Uh, I'm hoping the Maxims will be coming. Um, this guns are good though. It can't hurt to have one. And uh, the Puma is getting repaired over here. Very rapid repairs with two units of uh, Storm Pioneers there. T3485 starting to accrue some value on the field here. That's nice. Kettenwerfer does have it in arc right now. Uh, that's... Uh, going to be displaced by all of this stuff. Puma comes in, so look for that one to get its third star of veterancy here. Oh, he gets so unlucky. As soon as he gets that third star of veterancy, you start much more reliably penetrating the Soviet medium, so that's the real barrier here. If he can even get some machine gun rounds, oh no, the PTRS is going to screen the Puma away, actually. So yeah, life continues to be very difficult here for Animal Killer, who actually has gotten the Schwerpanzer HQ deployed in a very forward location. This is covering a fuel and a uh, a VP. So this is really good. It's quite exposed, so there's a real danger of this getting sieged down by the Zis gun. Or just the two T-3485s running in and steamrolling it. And there, and there will probably be two T-3485s as this game continues here. Um, but this is nice for now. And, I, you know, as I said earlier, if you can hold on to one fuel point and one victory point, then you are maybe okay. But I feel like we're actually entering the late stages of the game where that stops, you know, being enough. Um, so we have just about enough victory points here to make a concerted play and try and get something done. We have a lot of fuel, we have the manpower to spend it. Schwer Panzer authorization has finished, so I think now is when we need to really see like a Jag Panzer to stabilize, or a Panzer IV would also be fine. In fact, I don't know. I don't. I'm not, I don't know about Panzer IV when your opponent has six PTRSs and two T3485s. Though I think it's it's quite hard to use, but. Anyway, Bundle Grenade comes down. Looks like uh, Kanji definitely paying attention. Going to get those ones out of there. Axis Force is being forced back as well. Rakettenwerfer has the T-3485 in arc. And that's going to force the Soviets back here for now. I would love I would love him to just... Uh, I don't know. I, I, it's difficult to try and siege the, um, the Schwerpanzer HQ down there because you give up so much field control. Uh, Datton, is that a Yagdi and Panzer IV Bulletin? Yes, that's the 3% faster reload and 3% faster rotation on Yag Panzers, which actually is, sounds pretty good. Uh, Rakettenwerfer has 3% increased and Shermans and Panthers have increased armor. So anyway, this T-3485 gets the angle on the Rakettenwerfer and that'll force that one back. Three stars of veterancy has finished on the Puma, so that is now a Tank Hunter Light. Like, that is just a Tank Hunter Light. It's very good at that. Um, and it's going to be a Panther here for Animal Killer. Okay, looking to make use of his uh, Panthers have 4% increased armor bulletin. Uh, by the way, for the Soviet player, we've got mines cost less, mines build faster, and some conscript DPS. Those are the bulletins. Got you covered, Daten. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just reading chat here. There's actually been a lot coming through. Apart from... Yeah, I feel, I really feel for Russians, and to a certain extent Germans as well, because in basically all media, they are just kind of portrayed as the bad guys, like, without even thinking. In fact, to be honest, they're basically portrayed as fictional bad guys in almost everything, and I feel like media producers in the world generally have forgotten that, like, Russia and Germany are still countries, like, they continue to exist, you know? Because, like, in Call of Duty, for example, like, in most of the Call of Duty Modern Warfare games, like, the Russians are just spurious bad guys, and, like, they're just given stupid political motivations for wanting to cause carnage, and then that's what happens in the games, and it's like, but couldn't we have invented a false country and just, like, not made it about Russians? 
Like, wouldn't that have been better? I don't know. Maybe I'm being overly sensitive. But yeah, Russians are portrayed as the bad guys, like, all the time. And Russians are bad guys some of the time. Not all Russians are amazing people. Not all of anyone is amazing people. But like, I don't know. Yeah, they get a bad they get a bad rep in the media. Anyway, big fight coming down here as the Panther comes straight out, gets buttoned immediately by guards. The two T-3485s and the Zisk gun hooning away. The Panther limps back, just about still alive. Look at the Puma though, scoring consistent damage. The rate of fire just blitzing in. The three-star Pumas are so good against these Soviet mediums and it makes it very easy to get to four-star. As long as you remember to micro, we have to skip back here. Yeah, there we go. God damn, it's like they are such good tank hunters, these Pumas. Once they get to uh, three stars of veterancy, I absolutely love them. Um, yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Just some interesting comments from A Game in chat. Four stars of veterancy comes down, and the T3485 is picked off by the Puma here. Four stars of veterancy gives it. Extended range. Good god, these are good tank hunters. Please get the Puma out. Please get the Puma out. Come on now. Come on now. Let's repair the Puma. Four-star Pumas have e extended range with that incredibly fast-firing high-penetration gun. And he's going to rebuy the T-3485. I don't agree with this. Look at what you're facing, sir. This is a four-star Puma and a Panther. They're going to eat medium tanks all day. It's time to switch it up and go for something different, I think. That's my feeling. Uh, and also, I mean, he actually, he has mixed in a Maxim gun. Excellent. And this is helping to cover mid. Brilliant. Okay. That's that's nice. Whoa, I didn't also realize, actually, the German player has lost another Falschermjäger squad. Going to be rebuilding Obersoldaten. Jesus, the elite of the elite only fighting on this battlefield for the Axis forces. And that's kind of crazy. Oh, just going to pour myself some tea. My voice is starting to hurt. Hmm. God damn, that's good tea. Only the finest in the House of Magpie. Um. Okay. I mean, the Soviet player has an army, and the Axis player has this weird ragtag list of units, uh, but he's getting bled out. And it is probably a doable proposition just to win this game with a double cap now for uh, Kanji. I mean, I hate to give the Axis player more time to get out of this bind, but I feel like it's probably achievable. So, uh, yeah, that's probably achievable, isn't it? So, yeah, the T-34 getting hooned on a little bit by this Panther up here, but actually there's a bit of a spit roast established. A lot of hits coming in on that Panther. It's an expensive tank to be taking so much damage here. Infantry struggles continuing south of mid here, but the Obersoldaten and the Falschermjäger will get defeated by just loads of Soviet rifles, guards with DPs, just being guards with DPs. So it's, uh, it's all looking really good. Yeah, where's your SU-85? Yeah, you're telling me, man. I mean, that would be a useful tool here. But he's kind of getting it done with the uh, T-3485s at the moment. The Puma getting a bit caught out, and we'd love to pick that one up. That would be a hell of a prize for these Soviet mediums. Yeah, he's going to lose the Puma here. Smoke. Oh, God. He gets buttoned as well. Jesus Christ. How is this Puma alive? Five-star Puma now. So that gives it... Uh, enemy units can be sighted behind line of sight blockers. That's very nice. Oh, my God. Look at this Puma. He's going to get... Oh, my God. How did we not get either the Panther or the Puma and we lose both of the both of the T-3485s? I mean, if you're going to let Animal Killer back into the game, it's, it, is, it begins by looking like this. He still has to assault mid, though, and there's still a Maxim here, so I think this is very difficult. I can't believe we didn't close the door on the Puma because it was literally pinned against the edge of the map needing one more hit to die. I appreciate, yeah, two shots at least missed it. Oh my god, and captured Rakettenwerfers will do the job. Ziskun coming through for the final hit. And that was a great Puma though. Can we just say, five stars achieved. And I think it's fair to say all this stuff I say about Pumas being really good medium armor slayers once they get to three stars. Like, I think we saw that. Um... And to be honest, if the micro was a little bit more on point, and if the rest of the Axis composition looks a bit more normal, you can actually rely on that Puma a bit more heavily and uh, make it a real pain in the ass for the Allies to deal with. Like, 
because its primary target is vehicles, it vets up disproportionately quickly if it's hitting its main targets. And once you get to three stars, it's the value actually comes in really fast because you're so you're so frequently hitting for damage that it's actually quite easy to get from one five stars after that. Um, so. Yeah. Oh, for the Fatherland was used. Wow, cool. So these are Axis units busting out onto the map. Holy spoons, what am I seeing? Animal Killer taking a triple cap out on the map. God damn, this game continues to surprise. One has to feel like the Soviet player has inevitability on their side, but going for another T-34? This is just a regular T-34, a 76. Okay. I mean, I guess we've got a Kettenworth and a Zisk gun and all the PTRSs to deal with the Panther, so... Uh, maybe an okay T-34. We kind of just want to try and win the game. The Axis players on 36 tickets. Let's just try and get field control and close the door. S <clears throat> Pardon me. SU-85 lacks mobility. A real issue with vetted Puma on the field. Yeah, good point, Siglis. Um Yeah, the Puma does make you think twice about buying an SU-85. It's very easy for that Puma to kill it, but I feel like when your opponent's composition is sort of this small and terrible, it's really hard for that Puma to do that, and because your opponent's composition was so bad, if, even if they trade the Puma for the SU-85, because you've been winning so hard as the Soviet player, that's probably still acceptable. So, Axis Infantry trying to get work done. Uh, the Penals will get chased off of mid, uh, but North falls into Soviet hands. Obersoldaten cutting through here, but they're getting cut down in turn by these DP LMGs. Uh-oh, are you paying attention here, Animal Killer? Oh no, loses the Obersoldaten, can ill afford to be losing any units off of this Axis roster. And I feel like with the loss of the Obersoldaten, two stars finishes on the Panther, and it does get the Armoured Skirts, but I mean... I don't think it's going to be enough here. Obersoldaten taking mid, though, so he's not on the clock. This is looking like a very difficult proposition for our Axis player, though. What a bizarre game. Animal Killer would love an, an MG34, yeah. Would absolutely love one. Oh my god, the T34. This is why we bought it. It's just converting fuel into value. It's it's killing Axis infantry. These Falschermiegers need to fall back. The Panther will come up here to screen this one away. The engineers on the chopping block, but they get out. And Oh, go! Okay, if we can pick up this Maxim. If, if Animal Killer can pick up this Maxim, that's really big. That's, like, really big. He's going to go for the Zisk gun here, and that's also big. He switches to the Maxim. I don't know, bro. Pick one. I think killing the Zisk gun is probably better. But anyway. I mean, there is a timeline where from this position, the Axis player goes on to get a five-star Panther and, like, wins with all this elite infantry. Like, I'm just saying, it's not likely, but... I feel like Kanji has made a series of decisions that have allowed Animal Killer to persist in this game. And I don't know, it's actually looking a little bit tricky now for the Soviet player. I mean... I don't know. I don't want to call it too soon or anything. Hey Jono, nice to see you today. Um... Yeah, we've been up for nearly three hours now, Johnny, so just uh, just at the tail end of the stream here now. It's definitely the last game of the day. But yeah, this Panther gets buttoned. Damage coming down onto it. Gonna use Blitz to GTFO. Kettenwerfer, present and correct. But Axis forces grab north. Animal Killer persisting in this game. This is, this is too many Soviets, though. These uh, Storm Pioneers, they may have five stars of veterancy, but they will still have to give way. And, uh... There was a moment there where Animal Killer could have grabbed the Maxim, and I think that, that would have been so sick. If he has a Maxim on this composition, then I think there's a real game plan where you hold mid for dear life while your Panther scales up in veterancy. SU-85 going to be the pick here at last for... Uh, uh, for Kanji, and th this ought to be good against the Panther. Soviets are winning, yes, but they are taking the long road to victory. Um, some sort of strange choices being made, but... He can do combat repairs without taking extra damage. Oh, on the Storm Pioneers. That's really interesting, yeah. 
two squads of five star storm panthers. Anyway, here comes the panther, but the Raketenwerfer is here. Valshrim Jaeger is getting five stars of veterancy. Jesus Christ, these guys probably kill everything now. Wow, what do they get? They get the Frangi grenade. They get, uh, oh, actually, chance to be wiped. Oh! The T-34 closes the door. Those Falsham Jaegers are no more. Jeez, yikes. All right, then, there we go. Denied. Uh, actually, wait, let's get some VFX on that one. Denied. There we go, a little bit of Quake 3 goodness for you all there. Um... <laughs> this game is just pure caster curse. Yeah, there's been a lot of moments where I've been like, wow, as long as this doesn't happen, instantly happens. Uh, uh, but yeah, I feel like this is Animal Killer's last hurrah now. There's just uh, not enough infantry to make it work any longer. Too many Soviets coming forwards. That's a good grenade, though. Loses some another squad of Storm Pioneers here. The SU-85 is here. We'll probably get the KO, KO shot on this Panther. He's going to edge forwards here looking for the shot. Wow, not finding it, though. Can't really engage sight mode when, when there are this much infantry in your face, although we know that there's no Faust or real threats, so Animal Killer will GG at this point. What an interesting and bizarre game. Animal Killer definitely trying to do something a little bit unusual there. Um, definitely trying to uh, champion a novel style of OKW composition and teching. Um, relying on double Kubel opener, which was punished in a way that was unlucky. You don't always expect you're a Soviet opponent it's more likely that your Soviet opponent does not open with Special Rifle Command. And in that most likely case, uh, the Double Kubel is much better. But there was a Clown Car in this example, so that was a bit unlucky for Animal Killer. But not insurmountable. But I feel like once you double down... Um, this camera keeps wobbling away, doesn't it? There we go. Once you double down, I know we've got a bit of monitor here, but whatever, I'll, I'll fix it for next time. Once you double down on your weird opener by going for a weird composition that's so Storm Pioneer heavy, and then like going for Falsham Jaegers and stuff, like I feel like that really just robs you of so much momentum as the OKW player that it's actually quite hard to come back from that position, I think. But then on the other side of things, um, Kanji... Uh, didn't get the support weapon Campania for quite a long time. And there was like a really long time where the Axis player had like four or five infantry units that were all really good. But where if there was a Maxim a lot earlier, one or two, two Maxims would have been amazing. But um, then like, it's like, okay, so your, your Axis opponent has all this really elite infantry, but how do they get any value out of it when they have to walk into two Maxims and they have no indirect fire solution? So it's like, that would have been really nice. Um, but eventually the adaptation came down and uh, Kanji did build this and the Maxim was very good this game even though it did get taken out but it still was good. Um, I also think that um, building medium tanks and especially the highest value density medium tank that you can buy, the T-3485 in this position, into an opponent who has quite the vetted Puma is a risky proposition. If there's a timeline where Animal Killer is able to stabilize and like come back in the game, like it probably looks like the Soviet player building T-3485s and feeding them into a Puma. So I'd prefer to sort of avoid that whole dynamic and just go for another choice um, as the Soviet player. That's just how I feel though. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else I can really say about that game, other than that I'm very glad that we caught a sort of special snowflake of a game there. What a weird set of games we've had today, just weird games, loads of weird games. Um, but enjoyable nonetheless, it has been very fun to bring them to you. Um, so uh, before I head off, I'm going to do a little schedule announcement here, so da -da -da -da, here we go. This is when we'll be streaming next week. I'll be coming at you guys at midday, that's 1100 hours GMT. Uh, next week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, so we'll be casting some Company of Heroes too, and we'll also hopefully be doing some other things. As I was saying earlier on this stream, we've got the video capture card set up, and we're ready to roll with a couple of different things. So hopefully a bit more variety next week. Um, but um, what a great first week of streaming this has been, I know. Like, this has just been so much fun. Um, we've got the stream looking way more professional than I ever thought I would have a stream looking, certainly after, like, five days. You know, we've got Stinger transitions, we've got cool backgrounds, we've got some new channel art... Um, it's just the coolest thing. Um, and every day, you know, I was just saying earlier, but literally on Monday, I was like, if I could stream to like this many people on a daily basis, like that is like right out there. And we've achieved it in week one. Like what the hell? It's so cool. So, um, thank you very much, everybody. It means the world to me that people are tuning in and like interacting in real time and enjoying the games. And, uh, you know, that's just great. It's just been great. I've, I've had a ton of fun. So, 
lockdown is still happening. The world's still in a pretty crazy place, which gives me a lot more free time. So yeah, for sure. Um, we're going to be doing some more streaming next week and it's going to be great. Um, we'll just have a quick read through chat and see if anybody, uh, if there's anything to, to respond to here, if anyone has any questions or whatever. Da, 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 da. This game is cast a curse. Saying 1100 hours GMT instead of 1200 BST when you're in England. Well, because not everyone's in England. And if I say I'm casting at midday in England, most people will Google that. And then, because the GMT line literally runs through London, right? Like, so most people think that English time is, G is, is, is GMT. You'd have to know a little bit about England to realize that we actually change our clocks for the summer because we're weird. Um, so, uh... The follow animation showed up for like half a second. Oh yeah, see this is it, it's bugged. So Mangorka, thanks very much for following. You rock, really appreciate the follow there in chat buddy, trying to find that, there it is there. Yeah, trying to find that one in chat. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that the notifications are broken. We're gonna get them fixed for next week. I'm, I've tried a lot of things. I need to try some more things and then worst case scenario, I can move to a different service provider for my alerts. Um, but yeah, um, thank you very much for following. Much appreciated. Uh, and uh, thanks, A Game, for um, A Game, or just anybody else. Can I ask when the follow animation showed up for half a second? Was it the stupid zombie, or was it a different one? Because if it was the stupid zombie, I think there's something wrong on um, Streamlabs's Streamlabs's side, and it's not updated. That's what I. It's not updating. It was a zombie, yeah. So it's jammed. It's like stuck. No matter what changes I make, it's literally not updating the settings on Streamlabs's end of things. The other notifications are all working fine. I've tried refreshing the URL. I've tried a lot of other things. So I don't know. I'll figure it out. We've got we've got things we can try still. So yeah, that will conclude today's stream. What what were we up for? Three hours, three minutes, and fifty seconds so far. It's been hilarious. A weird clutch of games, but I loved it all. Thank you very much to all of you for tuning in. And we're gonna go and find somebody else to raid. Let's uh, let's get this raid on the go. So let's have a look now. Let's see who's streaming Company of Heroes at the moment. Twitch.tv. Da 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 da. Company of Heroes. Um. Somebody Korean is streaming. Uh, why is it displaying this in such a weird way? There we go. That's better. Uh, Orange Pest is streaming. Sweet. Oh, go on then. Let's let's raid Orange Pest. That's good stuff. All right. Okay, guys. Thanks very much. And uh, I'm going to raid you all guys onto uh, uh, onto um, Orange Pest here. And I'll catch you guys next Monday at midday. This for now, Magpie842, signing out.